Section 22 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women. Section 22 Glumdal Clitches. This title was wittingly given by an editor of this city to the ideal woman demanded in Woman in the Nineteenth Century. We do not object to it, thinking it is really desirable that women should grow beyond the average size which has been prescribed for them. We find in the last news from Paris these anecdotes of two who tower an inch or more above their sex, if not yet of Glumdalclitch stature. Bravissima! The 7th of May at Paris, a young girl, who was washing linen, fell into the canal St. Martin. Those around called out for help, but none ventured to give it. Just then a young lady elegantly dressed came up and saw the case. In the twinkling of an eye she threw off her hat and shawl, threw herself in, and succeeded in dragging the young girl to the brink after having sought for her in vain several times under the water. This lady was Mademoiselle Adèle Chevalier, an actress. She was carried with the girl she had saved into a neighboring house, which she left after having received the necessary cares, in a fiacre and amid the plaudits of the crowd. The second anecdote is of a different kind, but displays a kind of magnanimity still more unusual in this poor servile world. One of our French most distinguished painters of sea subjects, Goudin, has married a rich young English lady, belonging to a family of high rank, and related to the Duke of Wellington. M. Goudin was lately at Berlin at the same time with K inspector of pictures to the king of holland the king of prussia desired that both artists should be presented to him and received godin in a very flattering manner his genius being his only letter of recommendation monsieur k has not the same advantage but to make up for it he has a wife who enjoys in holland a great reputation for her beauty the king of prussia is a cavalier who cares more for pretty ladies than for genius. So Monsieur and Madame K. were invited to the royal table, an honor which was not accorded to Monsieur and Madame Goudon. Humble representations were made to the monarch, advising him not to make such a marked distinction between the French artist and the Dutch amateur. These failing, the wise counselors went to Madame Goudon, and, intimating that they did so with the good will of the king, said that she might be received as cousin to the Duke of Wellington, as daughter of an English general, and of a family which dates back to the thirteenth century. She could, if she wished, avail herself of her rights of birth to obtain the same honors with Madame K. To sit at the table of the king she need only cease for a moment to be Madame Goudon, and become once more Lady L., does not all this sound like a history of the seventeenth century? Surely etiquette was never maintained in a more arrogant manner at the court of Louis the Fourteenth. But Madame Goudon replied that her highest pride lay in the celebrated name which she bears at present, that she did not wish to rely on any other to obtain so futile a distinction, and that in her eyes the most noble escutcheon was the palate of her husband. I need not say that this dignified feeling was not comprehended. Madame Goudon was not received at the table, but she had shown the nobleness of her character. For the rest, Madame K., on arriving at Paris, had the bad taste to boast of having been distinguished above Madame Goudon, and the story reaching the Tuileries, where Monsieur and Madame Goudon are highly favored, excited no little mirth in the circle there. End of section 22. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Section 23 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers 
relating to the sphere, condition, and duties of women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 23. Ellen, or Forgive and Forget. We notice this coarsely written little fiction because it is one of a class which we see growing with pleasure. We see it with pleasure because in its way it is genuine. It is the transcript of the crimes, calumnies, excitements, half-blind love of right, and honest indignation at the sort of wrong which it can discern, to be found in the class from which it emanates. That class is a large one in our country villages and these books reflect its thoughts and manners as halfpenny ballads do the life of the streets of london the ballads are not more true to the facts but they give us in a coarser form far more of the spirit than we get from the same facts reflected in the intellect of a dickens for instance or of any writer far enough above the scene to be properly its artist so in this book we find what cooper miss sedgwick and mrs kirkland might see as the writer did but could hardly believe in enough to speak of it with such fidelity it is a current superstition that country people are more pure and healthy in mind and body than those who live in cities it may be so in countries of old established habits where a genuine peasantry have inherited some of the practical wisdom and loyalty of the past with most of its errors we have our doubts, though, from the stamp upon literature, always the nearest evidence of truth we can get, whether, even there, the difference between town and country life is as much in favor of the latter as is generally supposed. But in our land, where the country is at present filled with a mixed population, who comes seeking to be purified by a better life and culture from all the ills and diseases of the worst forms of civilization, things often look worse than in the city perhaps because men have more time and room to let their faults grow and offend the light of day there are exceptions and not a few but in a very great proportion of country villages the habits of the people as to food air and even exercise are ignorant and unhealthy to the last degree their want of all pure faith and appetite for coarse excitement is shown by continued intrigues calumnies and crimes we have lived in a beautiful village where more favorably placed than any other person in it both as to withdrawal from bad associations and nearness to good we heard inevitably from domestics work people and school children more ill of human nature than we could possibly sift were we to elect such a task from all the newspapers of this city in the same space of time we believe the amount of ill circulated by means of anonymous letters as described in this book to be as great as can be imported in all the french novels and that is a bold word we know ourselves of two or three cases of morbid wickedness displayed by means of anonymous letters that may vie with what puzzled the best wits of france in a famous lawsuit not long since it is true there is to balance all this a healthy rebound a surprise and a shame and there are heartily good people such as are described in this book who having taken a direction upward keep it and cannot be bent downward nor aside but then the reverse of the picture is of a blackness that would appall one who came to it with any idyllic ideas of the purity and peaceful loveliness of agricultural life but what does this prove only the need of a dissemination of all that is best intellectually and morally through the whole people 
our groves and fields have no good fairies or genii who teach by legend or gentle apparition the truths the principles that can alone preserve the village as the city from the possession of the fiend their place must be taken by the schoolmaster and he must be one who knows not only readin writin and arithmetic but the service of god and the destiny of man our people require a thoroughly diffused intellectual life a religious aim such as no people at large ever possessed before else they must sink till they become dregs rather than rise to become the cream of creation which they are too apt to flatter themselves with the fancy of being already the most interesting fiction we have ever read in this coarse homely but genuine class is one called metallic it may be in circulation in this city but we bought it in a country nook and from a peddler and it seemed to belong to the country had we met with it in any other way it would probably have been to throw it aside again directly for the author does not know how to write english and the first chapters give no idea of his power of apprehending the poetry of life but happening to read on we became fixed and charmed and have retained from its perusal the sweetest picture of life lived in this land ever afforded us out of the pale of personal observation that such things are private observation has made us sure but the writers of books rarely seem to have seen them rarely to have walked alone in an untrodden path long enough to hold commune with the spirit of the scene in this book you find the very life the most vulgar prose and the most exquisite poetry you follow the hunter in his path walking through the noblest and fairest scenes only to shoot the poor animals that were happy there winning from the pure atmosphere little benefit except to good appetite sleeping at night in the dirty hovels with people who burrow in them to lead a life but little above that of the squirrels and foxes there is throughout that air of room enough and free of low forms of human nature which at such times makes bearable all that would otherwise be so repulsive but when we come to the girl who is the presiding deity or rather the tutelary angel of the scene how are all discords harmonized how all its latent music poured forth it is a portrait from the life it has the mystic charm of fulfilled reality how far beyond the fairest ideals ever born of thought pure and brilliantly blooming as the flower of the wilderness she in like manner shares while she sublimes its nature she plays round the most vulgar and rude beings gentle and caressing yet unsullied in her wildness there is nothing cold or savage her elevation is soft and warm never have we seen natural religion more beautifully expressed never so well discerned the influence of the natural nun who needs no veil or cloister to guard from profanation the beauty she has dedicated to god and which only attracts human love to hallow it into the divine the lonely life of the girl after the death of her parents her fearlessness her gay and sweet enjoyment of nature her intercourse with the old people of the neighborhood her sisterly conduct towards her suitors all seem painted from the life but the deathbed scene seems borrowed from some sermon and is not in harmony with the rest in this connection we must try to make amends for the stupidity of an earlier notice of the novel called margaret or the real and ideal etc at the time of that notice we had only looked into it here and there and did no justice to a work full of genius profound in its meaning and of admirable fidelity to nature in its details since then we have really read it and appreciated the sight and representation of soul realities and we have lamented the long delay of so true a pleasure a fine critic said this is a yankee novel or rather let it be called the yankee novel as nowhere else are the thought and dialect of our villages really represented another discovered that it must have been written in maine by the perfection with which peculiar features of scenery that are described 
a young girl could not sufficiently express her delight at the simple nature with which scenes of childhood are given and especially at margaret's first going to meeting she had never elsewhere found written down what she had felt a mature reader one of the most spiritualized and harmonious minds we have ever met admires the depth and fullness in which the workings of the spirit through the maiden's life are seen by the author and shown to us but laments the great apparatus with which the consummation of the whole is brought about and the formation of a new church and state before the time is yet ripe under the banner of monsignor christi but all these voices among those most worthy to be heard find in the book a real presence and draw from it auspicious omens that an american literature is possible even in our day because there are already in the mind here existent developments worthy to see the light goldfishes amid the moss and the still waters for ourselves we have been most charmed with the way the real and ideal are made to weave and shoot rays through one another in which margaret bestows on external nature what she receives through books and wins back like gifts in turn till the pond and the mythology are alternate sections of the same chapter we delight in the teachings she receives through chilion and his violin till on the grave of one who tried to love his fellow men grows up the full white rose flower of her life the ease with which she assimilates the city life when in it making it a part of her imaginative tapestry is a sign of the power to which she has grown we have much more to think and to say of the book as a whole and in parts and should the mood and summer leisure ever permit a familiar and intimate acquaintance with it we trust they will be both thought and said for the present we will only add that it exhibits the same state of things and strives to point out such remedies as we have hinted at in speaking of the little book which heads this notice itself a rude charcoal sketch but if read as hieroglyphics are pointing to important meanings and results end of section 23 ellen or forgive and forget recording by pamela krantz Section 24 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duty of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 24. Courrier des états unis no other nation can hope to vie with the french in the talent of communicating information with ease vivacity and consciousness they must always be the best narrators and the best interpreters so far as presenting a clear statement of outlines goes thus they are excellent in conversation lectures and journalizing after we know all the news of the day it is still pleasant to read the bulletin of the courrier des états unis we rarely agree with the view taken but as a summary it is so excellently well done every topic put in its best place with such a light and vigorous hand that we have the same pleasure we have felt in fairy tales when some person under trial is helped by a kind fairy to sort the silks and feathers to their different places till the glittering confusion assumes the order of a kaleidoscope then what excellent correspondence they have in paris what a humorous and yet clear account we have before us now of the tiers game we have traced guizot through every day with the utmost distinctness and see him perfectly in the sick-room now here is tiers playing with his chessmen jesuits etc a hundred clumsy english or american papers could not make the present crisis in paris so clear as we see it in the glass of these nimble frenchmen certainly it is with newspaper writing as with food the english and americans have as good appetites but do not and never will know so well how to cook as the french the parisian correspondent of the schnell post also makes himself merry with the play of monsieur thiers both speak with some feeling of the impressive utterance of lamartine in the late debates 
the Jesuits stand their ground, but there is a wave advancing which will not fail to wash away what ought to go, nor are its roarings, however much in advance of the wave itself, to be misinterpreted by intelligent ears. The world is raising its sleepy lids, and soon no organization can exist which from its very nature interferes in any way with the good of the whole. In Germany the terrors of the authorities are more and more directed against the communists. They are very anxious to know what communism really is, or means. They have almost forgotten, says the correspondent, the repression of the Jews, and like objects in this new terror. Meanwhile the Russian emperor has issued an edict commanding the Polish Jews, both men and women, to lay aside their national garb. He hopes thus to mingle them with the rest of the mass he moves. It will be seen whether such work can be done by beginning upon the outward man. The Paris correspondent of the Courrier, who gives an account of amusements, has always many sprightly passages illustrative of the temper of the times. Horse-races are now the fashion, in which he rejoices, as being likely to give to France good horses of her own. A famous lottery is on the point of coming off, to give an organ to the church of saint Eustache, on which it does not require a very high tone of morals to be severe. A public exhibition has been made of the splendid array of prizes, including every article of luxury, from jewels and cashmere shawls down to artificial flowers. A nobleman, president of the Horticultural Society, had given an entertainment, in which the part of the different flowers was acted by beautiful women, that of fruit and vegetables by distinguished men. Such an amusement would admit of much light grace and wit, which may still be found in France, if anywhere in the world. There is also an amusing story of the stir caused among the French political leaders by the visit of a nobleman of one of the great English families to Paris. He had had several audiences, previous to his departure from London, of Queen Victoria. He received a dispatch daily from the English court. But in reply to all overtures made to induce him to open his mission, he preserved a gloomy silence. All attentions, all signs of willing confidence are lavished on him in vain. France is troubled. Has England, thought she, a secret from us, while we have none from her? She was on the point of inventing one, when, lo, the secret mission turns out to be the preparation of a ball-dress, with whose elegance, fresh from Parisian genius, her Britannic majesty wished to dazzle and surprise her native realm. Tis a pity the Americans cannot learn the grace which decks these trifling jests with so much prettiness. Till we can import something of that we have no right to rejoice in French fashions and French wines. Such a nervous, driving nation as we are ought to learn to fly along gracefully on the light, fantastic toe. Can we not learn something of the English besides the knife and fork conventionalities, which with them express a certain solidity of fortune and resolve? Can we not get from the French something besides their worst novels? Courrier des États-Unis, our protégé, Queen Victoria. The courrier laughs, though with features somewhat too disturbed for a graceful laugh, at a notice, published a few days since in the Tribune, of one of its jests which scandalized the American editor. It does not content itself with a slight notice, but puts forth a manifesto in formidably large type in reply. With regard to the jest itself, we must remark that Mr. Greeley saw this only in a translation, where it had lost whatever of light and graceful in its manner excused a piece of raillery very coarse in its substance. We will admit that, had he seen it as it originally stood, connected with other items in the playful chronicle of Pierre Durand, it would have impressed him differently. But the cause of irritation in the courrier, and of the sharp repartees of its manifesto, is probably what was said of the influence among us of French literature and French morals, to which the organ of the French-American population felt called on to make a spirited reply, and has done so with less of wit and courtesy than could have been expected from the organ of a people, who, whatever may be their faults, are at least acknowledged in wit and courtesy preeminent. We hope that the French who come to us will not become in these respects Americanized, and substitute the easy sneer and use of such terms as ridiculous, virtuous misanthropy, etc., for the graceful and poignant raillery of their native land, which tickles even where it wounds. We may say, in reply to the Courrier, that if Fourierism recoils towards a state of nature, 
It rises largely from the fact that its author lived in a country where the natural relations are, if not more cruelly, at least more lightly violated, than in any other of the civilized world. The marriage of convention has done its natural office in sapping the morals of France, till breach of the marriage vow has become one of the chief topics of its daily wit, one of the acknowledged traits of its manners, and a favorite, in these modern times we might say the favorite, subject of its works of fiction. From the time of Moliere, himself an agonized sufferer behind his comic mask from the infidelities of a wife he was not able to cease to love, through memoirs, novels, dramas, and the volleyed squibs of the press, one fact stares us in the face as one of so common occurrence, that men, if they have not ceased to suffer in heart and morals from its poisonous action, have yet learned to bear with a shrug and a careless laugh that marks its frequency. Understand, we do not say that the French are the most deeply stained with vice of all nations. We do not think them so. There are others where there is as much, but there is none where it is so openly acknowledged in literature, and therefore there is none whose literature alone is so likely to deprave inexperienced minds, by familiarizing them with wickedness before they have known the lure and the shock of passion. And we believe that this is the very worst way for youth to be misled, since the miasma thus pervades the whole man, and he is corrupted in head and heart at once, without one strengthening effort at resistance. Were it necessary, we might substantiate what we say by quoting from the Courrier within the last fortnight, jokes and stories such as are not to be found so frequently in the prints of any other nation. There is the story of the girl Adelaide, which at other time we mean to quote for its terrible pathos. There is a man on trial for the murder of his wife, of whom the witnesses say, he was so fond of her you would never have known she was his wife. Here is one only yesterday where a man kills a woman to whom he was married by his relatives at eighteen, she being much older and disagreeable to him, but their properties matching. After twelve years' marriage he can no longer support the yoke, and kills both her and her father, and his only regret is that he cannot kill all who had anything to do with the match. Either infidelity or such crimes are the natural result of marriages made as they are in France, by agreement between the friends, without choice of the parties. It is this horrible system, and not a native incapacity for pure and permanent relations, that leads to such results. We must observe, en passant, that this man was the father of five children by this hated woman, a wickedness not peculiar to France or any nation, and which cannot fail to do its work of filling the world with sickly, weak, or depraved beings, who have reason to curse their brutal father that he does not murder them as well as their wretched mother, who, more unhappy than the victim of seduction, is made the slave of sense in the name of religion and law. The last steamer brings us news of the disgrace of Victor Hugo, one of the most celebrated of the literary men of France, and but lately created one of her peers. The affair, however, is to be publicly hushed up. But we need not cite many instances to prove what is known to the whole world, that these wrongs are, if not more frequent, at least more lightly treated by the French, in literature and discourse, than by any nation of Europe. This being the case, can an American, anxious that his country should receive as her only safeguard from endless temptations, good moral instruction and mental food, be otherwise than grieved at the promiscuous introduction among us of their writings. We know that there are in France good men, pure books, true wit. But there is an immensity that is bad and more hurtful to our farmers, clerks, and country milliners than to those to whose tastes it was originally addressed, as the smallpox is most fatal among the wild men of the woods, and this from the unprincipled cupidity of publishers is broadcast recklessly over all the land we had hoped would become a healthy asylum for those before crippled and tainted by hereditary abuses. This cannot be prevented. We can only make head against it, and show that there is really another way of thinking and living, I and another voice for it in the world. We are naturally on the alert, and if we sometimes start too quickly, that is better than to play Le Noir Fanéant, the Black Sluggard. We are displeased at the unfeeling manner in which the courier speaks of those whom he calls our models. He did not misunderstand us, and some things he says on this subject deserve and suggest a retort that would be bitter. But we forbear, because it would injure the innocent with the guilty. The courier ranks the editor of the Tribune among 
the men who have undertaken an ineffectual struggle against the perversities of this lower world. By ineffectual we presume he means that it has never succeeded in exiling evil from this lower world. We are proud to be ranked among the band of those who at least, in the ever-memorable words of Scripture, have done what they could for this purpose. To this band belong all good men of all countries, and France has contributed no small contingent of those whose purpose was noble, whose lives were healthy, and whose minds, even in their lightest moods, pure. We are better pleased to act as subtler or pursuivant of this band, whose strife the courier thinks so impuissant, than to reap the rewards of efficiency on the other side. There is not too much of this salt in proportion to the whole mass that needs to be salted, nor are occasional accesses of virtuous misanthropy the worst of maladies in a world that affords such abundant occasion for it. In fine, we disclaim all prejudice against the French nation. We feel assured that all, or almost all, impartial minds will acquiesce in what we say as to the tone of lax morality, in reference to marriage, so common in their literature. We do not like it, in joke or in earnest. Neither are we of those to whom vice loses most of its deformity by losing all its grossness. If there be a deep and ulcerated wound, we think the more the richly embroidered veil is torn away the better. Such a deep social wound exists in France. We wish its cure, as we wish the health of all nations and of all men. So far indeed would we recoil toward a state of nature. We believe that nature wills marriage and parentage to be kept sacred. The fact of their not being so is to us not a pleasant subject of jest, and we should really pity the First Lady of England for injury here, though she be a queen while the ladies of the French court or of Parisian society, if they willingly lend themselves to be the subject of this style of jest, or find it agreeable when made, must be to us the cause both of pity and disgust. We are not unaware of the great and beautiful qualities native to the French, of their chivalry, their sweetness of temper, their rapid, brilliant, and abundant genius. We would wish to see these qualities restored to their native lustre, and not receive the base alloy which has long stained the virginity of the gold. End of section 24 Section 25 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women Section 25 On Books of Travel Review of Memoirs and Essays by Mrs. Jameson On Books of Travel Footnote It need not be said, probably, that Margaret Fuller did not think the fact that books of travel by women have generally been piquant and lively rather than discriminating and instructive, a result of their nature, and therefore unavoidable. On the contrary, she regarded woman as naturally more penetrating than man, and the fact that in journeying she would see more of home life than he would give her a great advantage. But she did believe woman needed a wider culture, and then she would not fail to excel in writing books of travels. The merits now in such works she considered striking and due to woman's natural quickness in availing herself of all her facilities, and any deficiencies simply proved the need of a broader education. Editor. End footnote. Among those we have, the best, as to observation of particulars and lively expression, are by women. They are generally ill-prepared as regards previous culture, and their scope is necessarily narrower than that of men, but their tact and quickness help them a great deal. You can see their minds grow by what they feed on when they travel. There are many books of travel by women that are at least entertaining and contain some penetrating and just observations. There has, however, been none since Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, with as much talent, liveliness, and preparation to observe in various ways as she had. A good article appeared lately in one of the English periodicals, headed by a long list of travels by women. 
it was easy to observe that the personality of the writer was the most obvious thing in each and all of these books and that even in the best of them you travelled with the writer as a charming or amusing companion rather than as an accomplished or instructed guide review of memoirs and essays by mrs jameson mrs jameson appears to be growing more and more desperately modest if we may judge from the motto what if the little rain should say so small a drop as i can ne'er refresh the thirsty plain i'll tarry in the sky and other superstitious doubts and disclaimers proffered in the course of the volume we thought the time had gone by when it was necessary to plead request of friends for printing and that it was understood nowadays that from the facility of getting thoughts into print literature has become not merely an archive for the preservation of great thoughts but a means of general communication between all classes of minds and all grades of culture if writers write much that is good and write it well they are read much and long if the reverse people simply pass them by and go in search of what is more interesting there needs be no great fuss about publishing or not publishing those who forbear may rather be considered the vain ones who wish to be distinguished among the crowd especially this extreme modesty looks superfluous in a person who knows her thoughts have been received with interest for ten or twelve years back we do not like this from mrs jameson because we think she would be amazed if others spoke of her as this little humble flower doubtful whether it ought to raise its head to the light she should leave such affectations to her aunts they were the fashion in their day it is very true however that she should not have published the very first paragraph in her book which presents an inaccuracy and shallowness of thought quite amazing in a person of her fine perceptions talent and culture we allude to the contrast she attempts to establish between raphael and titian in placing mind in contradistinction to beauty as if beauty were merely physical of course she means no such thing but the passage means this or nothing and as an opening to a paper on art it is indeed reprehensible and fallacious the rest of this paper called the house of titian is full of pleasant chat though some of the judgments that passed on canaletti's pictures for instance are opposed to those of persons of the purest taste and in other respects such as in speaking of the railroad to venice mrs jameson is much less wise than those over whom she assumes superiority the railroad will destroy venice the two things cannot coexist and those who do not look upon that wondrous dream in this age will probably find only vestiges of its existence the picture of adelaide kemble is very pretty though there is an attempt of a sort too common with mrs jameson to make more of the subject than it deserves adelaide kemble was not the true artist or she could not so soon or so lightly have stepped into another sphere it is enough to paint her as a lovely woman and a woman genius the true artist cannot forswear his vocation heaven does not permit it the attempt makes him too unhappy nor will he form ties with those who can consent to such sacrilege adelaide kemble loved art but was not truly an artist the xanthian marbles and washington alston are very pleasing papers the most interesting part however are the sentences copied from mr alston these have his chaste superior tone we copy some of them what light is in the natural world such is fame in the intellectual both requiring an atmosphere in order to become perceptible hence the fame of michael angelo is to some minds a non-entity even as the sun itself would be invisible in vacuo a very pregnant statement containing the true reason why no man is a hero to his valet de chambre fame does not depend on the will of any man but reputation may be given and taken away for fame is the sympathy of kindred intellects and sympathy is not a subject of willing while reputation having its source in the popular voice is a sentence which may be altered or suppressed at pleasure reputation 
being essentially contemporaneous, is always at the mercy of the envious and ignorant. But fame, whose very birth is posthumous, and which is only known to exist by the echoes of its footsteps through congenial minds, can neither be increased nor diminished by any degree of willfulness. An original mind is rarely understood until it has been reflected from some half-dozen congenial with it. So averse are men to admitting the true in an unusual form. While any novelty, however fantastic, however false, is greedily swallowed. Nor is this to be wondered at, for all truth demands a response, and few people care to think, yet they must have something to supply the place of thought. Every mind would appear original if every man had the power of projecting his own into the minds of others. All effort at originality must end either in the quaint or monstrous, for no man knows himself as an original. He can only believe it on the report of others to whom he is made known, as he is by the projecting power before spoken of. There is an essential meanness in wishing to get the better of any one. The only competition worthy of a wise man is with himself. Reverence is an ennobling sentiment. It is felt to be degrading only by the vulgar mind, which would escape the sense of its own littleness by elevating itself into the antagonist of what is above it. He that has no pleasure in looking up is not fit to look down. Of such minds are the mannerists in art, and in the world, the tyrants of all sorts. Make no man your idol, for the best man must have faults, and his faults will naturally become yours, in addition to your own. This is as true in art as in morals. The devil's heartiest laugh is at a detracting witticism. Hence the phrase, devilish good, has sometimes a literal meaning. Woman's Mission and Woman's Position is an excellent paper, in which plain truths are spoken with an honorable straightforwardness and a great deal of good feeling. We despise the woman who, knowing such facts, is afraid to speak of them. Yet we honor one, too, who does the plain right thing, for she exposes herself to the assaults of vulgarity in a way painful to a person who has not strength to find shelter and repose in her motives. We recommend this paper to the consideration of all those, the unthinking, willfully unseeing million, who are in the habit of talking of woman's sphere, as if it really were, at present, for the majority, one of protection and the gentle offices of home. The rhetorical gentlemen and silken dames, who, quite forgetting their washerwomen, their seamstresses, and the poor hirelings for the sensual pleasures of man, that jostle them daily in the streets, talk as if women need be fitted for no other chance than that of growing like cherished flowers in the garden of domestic love, are requested to look at this paper, in which the state of women, both in the manufacturing and agricultural districts of England, is exposed with eloquence, and just inferences drawn. This, then, is what I mean when I speak of the anomalous condition of women in these days. I would point out, as a primary source of incalculable mischief, the contradiction between her assumed and her real position, between what is called her proper sphere by the laws of God and nature, and what has become her real sphere by the laws of necessity, and through the complex relations of artificial existence. In the strong language of Carlyle, I would say that here is a lie standing up in the midst of society. I would say, down with it, even to the ground, for while this perplexing and barbarous anomaly exists, fretting like an ulcer at the very heart of society, all new specifics and palliatives are in vain. The question must be settled one way or another, either let the man and all the relations of life be held the natural guardian of the woman, constrained to fulfill that trust, responsible in society for her well-being and her maintenance, or if she be liable to be thrust from the sanctuary of home to provide for herself through the exercise of such faculties 
as God has given her, let her at least have fair play. Let it not be avowed in the same breath that protection is necessary to her, and that it is refused her. And while we send her forth into the desert, and bind the burthen on her back, and put the staff in her hand, let not her steps be beset, her limbs fettered, and her eyes blindfolded. Amen. The sixth and last of these papers on the relative social position of mothers and governesses exhibits in true and full colors a state of things in England, beside which the custom in some parts of China of drowning female infants looks mild, generous, and refined and a cursed state of things beneath whose influence nothing can and nothing ought to thrive though this paper of which we have not patience to speak further at this moment is valuable from putting the facts into due relief it is very inferior to the other and shows the want of thoroughness and depth in mrs jameson's intellect she has taste feeling and knowledge but she cannot think out a subject thoroughly and is unconsciously tainted and hampered by conventionalities. Her advice to the governesses reads like a piece of irony, but we believe it was not meant as such. Advise them to be burnt at the stake at once, rather than submit to this slow process of petrifaction. She is as bad as the reports of the Society for the Relief of Distressed and Dilapidated Governesses. We have no more patience. We must go to England ourselves and see these victims under the water torture. Till then, adieu. End of section 25 Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 26 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 26. Woman's Influence Over the Insane. From a Review of Browning's Poems. In reference to what is said of entrusting an infant to the insane, we must relate a little tale which touched the heart in childhood from the eloquent lips of the mother. The minister of the village had a son of such uncommon powers that the slender means on which the large family lived were strained to the utmost to send him to college. The boy prized the means of study as only those under such circumstances know how to prize them, indeed far beyond their real worth since by excessive study, prolonged often at the expense of sleep, he made himself insane. All may conceive the feelings of the family when their star returned to them again, shorn of its beams. Their pride, their hard-earned hope, sunk to a thing so hopeless, so helpless, that there could be none so poor to do him reverence. But they loved him, and did what the ignorance of the time permitted. There was little provision then for the treatment of such cases, and what there was of a kind that they shrunk from resorting to, if it could be avoided. They kept him at home, giving him, during the first months, the freedom of the house. But on his making an attempt to kill his father, and confessing afterwards that his old veneration had, as is so often the case in such affections, reacted morbidly to its opposite so that he never saw a once-loved parent turn his back without thinking how he could rush upon him and do him an injury. They felt obliged to use harsher measures, and chained him to a post in one room of the house. There, so restrained, without exercise or proper medicine, the fever of insanity came upon him in its wildest form. He raved, shrieked, struck about him, and tore off all the raiment that was put upon him. One of his sisters, named Lucy, whom he had most loved when well, had now power to soothe him. He would listen to her voice and give way to a milder mood when she talked or sang. 
but this favorite sister married went to her new home and the maniac became wilder more violent than ever after two or three years she returned bringing with her an infant she went into the room where the naked blaspheming raging object was confined he knew her instantly and felt joy at seeing her but lucy said he suddenly is that your baby you have in your arms give it to me i want to hold it a pang of dread and suspicion shot through the young mother's heart she turned pale and faint her brother was not at that moment so mad that he could not understand her fears lucy said he do you suppose i would hurt your child his sister had strength of mind and of heart she could not resist the appeal and hastily placed the child in his arms poor fellow he held it a while stroked its little face and melted into tears the first he had shed since his insanity for some time after that he was better and probably had he been under such intelligent care as may be had at present the crisis might have been followed up and a favorable direction given to his disease but the subject was not understood then and having once fallen mad he was doomed to live and die a madman end of section 26 woman's influence over the insane from a review of browning's poems recording by pamela krantz section 27 of woman in the 19th century this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women. Section 27. Christmas Our festivals come rather too near together, since we have so few of them. Thanksgiving, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and then none again till July. We know not but these four, with the addition of a day set apart for fasting and prayer, might answer the purposes of rest and edification, as well as a calendar full of saints' days, if they were observed in a better spirit. But Thanksgiving is devoted to good dinners, Christmas and New Year's Days, to making presents and compliments fast day to playing at cricket and other games and the fourth of july to boasting of the past rather than to plans how to deserve its benefits and secure its fruits we value means of marking time by appointed days because man on one side of his nature so ardent and aspiring is on the other so indolent and slippery a being that he needs incessant admonitions to redeem the time time flows on steadily whether he regards it or not yet unless he keep time there is no music in that flow the sands drop with inevitable speed yet each waits long enough to receive if it be ready the intellectual touch that should turn it to a sand of gold time says the grecian fable is the parent of power power is the father of genius and wisdom time then is grandfather of the noblest of the human family and we must respect the aged sire whom we see on the frontispiece of the almanacs and believe his sigh was meant to mow down harvests ripened for an immortal use yet the best provision made by the mind of society at large for these admonitions soon loses its efficacy and requires that individual earnestness individual piety should continually reinforce the most beautiful form the world has never seen arrangements which might more naturally offer good suggestions than those of the church of rome the founders of that church stood very near a history radiant at every page with divine light all their rites and ceremonial days illustrate facts of an universal interest but the life with which piety first and afterwards the genius of great artists invested these symbols waned at last except to a thoughtful few reverence was forgotten in the multitude of genuflections 
the rosary became a string of beads rather than a series of religious meditations and the glorious company of saints and martyrs were not regarded so much as the teachers of heavenly truth as intercessors to obtain for their votaries the temporal gifts they craved yet we regret that some of those symbols had not been more reverenced by protestants as the possible occasion of good thoughts and among others we regret that the day set apart to commemorate the birth of jesus should have been stripped even by those who observe it of many impressive and touching accessories if ever there was an occasion on which the arts could become all but omnipotent in the service of a holy thought it is this of the birth of the child jesus in the palmy days of the catholic religion they may be said to have wrought miracles in its behalf and in our colder time when we rather reflect that light from a different point of view than transport ourselves into it who that has an eye and ear faithful to the soul is not conscious of inexhaustible benefits from some of the works by which sublime geniuses have expressed their ideas in the adorations of the magi and the shepherds in the virgin with the infant jesus or that work which expresses what christendom at large has not begun to realize that work which makes us conscious as we listen why the soul of man was thought worthy and able to upbear a cross of such dreadful weight the messiah of handel christmas would seem to be the day peculiarly sacred to children and something of this feeling is beginning to show itself among us though rather from german influence than of native growth the evergreen tree is often reared for the children on christmas evening and its branches cluster with little tokens that may at least give them a sense that the world is rich and that there are some in it who care to bless them it is a charming sight to see their glistening eyes and well worth much trouble in preparing the christmas tree yet on this occasion as on all others we should like to see pleasure offered to them in a form less selfish than it is when shall we read of banquets prepared for the halt the lame and the blind on the day that is said to have brought their friend into the world when will children be taught to ask all the cold and ragged little ones whom they have seen during the day wistfully gazing at the shop windows to share the joys of christmas eve we borrow the christmas tree from germany might we but borrow with it that feeling which pervades all their stories about the influence of the christ child and has i doubt not for the spirit of literature is always though refined the essence of popular life pervaded the conduct of children there we will mention two of these as happily expressive of different sides of the desirable character one is a legend of the saint herman joseph the legend runs that this saint when a little boy passed daily by a niche where was an image of the virgin and child and delighted there to pay his devotions his heart was so drawn towards the holy child that one day having received what seemed to him a gift truly precious a beautiful red and yellow apple he ventured to offer it with his prayer to his unspeakable delight the child put forth his hand and took the apple after that day never was a gift bestowed upon the little herman that was not carried to the same place he needed nothing for himself but dedicated all his childish goods to the altar after a while he was in trouble his father who was a poor man found it necessary to take him from school and bind him to a trade he communicated his woes to his friends of the niche and the virgin comforted him like a mother and bestowed on him money by means of which he rose to be a learned and tender shepherd of men another still more touching story is that of the holy rupert rupert was the only child of a princely house and had something to give besides apples but his generosity and human love were such that as a child he could never see poor children suffering without despoiling himself of all he had with him in their behalf his mother was at first displeased with this but when he replied they are thy children too 
her reproofs yielded to tears. One time, when he had given away his coat to a poor child, he got wearied and belated on his homeward way. He lay down a while and fell asleep. Then he dreamed that he was on a river shore and saw a mild and noble old man bathing many children. After he had plunged them into the water, he would place them on a beautiful island, where they looked white and glorious as little angels. Rupert was seized with a strong desire to join them, and begged the old man to bathe him also in the stream. But he was answered, It is not yet time. Just then a rainbow spanned the island, and in its arch was enthroned the child Jesus, dressed in a coat that Rupert knew to be his own. And the child said to the others, See this coat? It is one which my brother Rupert has just sent to me. He has given us many gifts from his love. Shall we not ask him to join us here? And they shouted a musical, Yes! And Rupert started out of his dream. But he had lain too long on the damp bank of the river without his coat, and cold and fever soon sent him to join the band of his brothers in their home. These are legends, superstitious, you will say, but in casting aside the shell have we retained the kernel? The image of the child Jesus is not seen in the open street. Does his heart find other means to express itself there? Protestantism does not mean, we suppose, to deaden the spirit in excluding the form. The thought of Jesus as a child has great weight with children who have learned to think of him at all. In thinking of him they form an image of all that the morning of a pure and fervent life should be and bring. In former days I knew a boy artist whose genius at that time showed high promise. He was not more than fourteen years old, a pale, slight boy, with a beaming eye. The hopes and sympathy of friends gained by his talent had furnished him with a studio and orders for some pictures. He had picked up from the streets a boy, still younger and poorer than himself, to take care of the room and prepare his colors, and the two boys were as content in their relation as Michelangelo with his Urbino. If you went there you found exposed to view many pretty pictures, a girl with a dove, the guitar player, and such subjects as are commonly supposed to interest at his age. But hid in a corner and never shown, unless to the beggar page or some most confidential friend, was the real object of his love and pride, the slowly growing work of secret hours. The subject of this picture was Christ teaching the doctors and in those doctors he had expressed all he had already observed of the pedantry and shallow conceit of those in whom mature years have not unfolded the soul, and in the child all he felt that early youth should be and seek, though, alas, his own feet failed him on the difficult road. This one record of the youth of Jesus had, at least, been much to his mind. In earlier days the little saints thought they best imitated the Emmanuel by giving apples and scents, but we know not why in our age that esteems itself so much enlightened they should not become also the givers of spiritual gifts. We see in them continually impulses that only require a good direction to effect infinite good. See the little girls at work for foreign missions, that is not useless. They devote the time to a purpose that is not selfish. The horizon of their thoughts is extended. But they are perfectly capable of becoming home missionaries as well. The principle of stewardship would make them so. I have seen a little girl of thirteen who had much service, too, to do for a hard-working mother, in the midst of a circle of poor children whom she gathered daily to a morning school. She took them from the doorsteps and the gutters, she washed their faces and hands, she taught them to read and sew, and told them stories that had delighted her own infancy. In her face, though in feature and complexion plain, was something already of a Madonna sweetness, and it had no way eclipsed the gaiety of childhood. I have seen a boy, scarce older, brought up for some time with the sons of laborers, who, so soon as he found himself possessed of superior advantages, 
thought not of surpassing others, but of excelling that he might be able to impart, and he was able to do it. If the other boys had less leisure and could pay for less instruction, they did not suffer by it. He could not be happy unless they also could enjoy Milton, and pass from nature to natural philosophy. He performed, though in a childish way, and in no Grecian garb, the part of Apollo amidst the herdsmen of Admetus. The cause of education would be indefinitely furthered if, in addition to formal means, there were but this principle awakened in the hearts of the young, that what they have they must bestow. All are not natural instructors, but a large proportion are, and those who do possess such a talent are the best possible teachers to those a little younger than themselves. Many have more patience with the difficulties they have lately left behind and enjoy their power of assisting more than those further removed in age and knowledge do. Then the intercourse may be far more congenial and profitable than where the teacher receives for hire all sorts of pupils as they are sent him by their guardians. Here he need only choose those who have a predisposition for what he is best able to teach, and as I would have the so-called higher instruction as much diffused in this way as the lower, there would be a chance of awakening all the power that now lies latent. If a girl, for instance, who has only a passable talent for music, but who, from the advantage of social position, has been able to gain thorough instruction, felt it her duty to teach whomsoever she know that had a talent without money to cultivate it, the good is obvious. Those who are learning receive an immediate benefit by the effort to rearrange and interpret what they learn, so the use of this justice would be twofold. Some efforts are made here and there, nay, sometimes there are those who can say they have returned usury for every gift of fate, and would others make the same experiments, they might find utopia not so far off as the children of this world, wise in securing their own selfish ease, would persuade us it must always be. We have hinted what sort of Christmas box we would wish for the children. It must be one as full as that of the Christ child must be, of the pieces of silver that were lost and are found. But Christmas, with its peculiar associations, has deep interest for men and women no less. At that time thus celebrated, a pure woman saw in her child what the son of man should be as a child of God. She anticipated for him a life of glory to God, peace and good will towards men. In any young mother's heart who has any purity of heart, the same feelings arise, but most of these mothers carelessly let them go without obeying their instructions. If they did not, we should see other children, other men than now throng our streets. The boy could not invariably disappoint the mother, the man, the wife, who steadily demanded of him such a career. And man looks upon woman in this relation, always as he should. Does he see in her a holy mother, worthy to guard the infancy of an immortal soul? Then she assumes in his eyes those traits which the Romish church loved to revere in Mary frivolity base appetite contempt are exercised and man and woman appear again in unprofaned connection as brother and sister children and servants of one divine love and pilgrims to a common aim were all this right in the private sphere the public would soon write itself also and the nations of christendom might join in a celebration such as kings and prophets waited for and so many martyrs died to achieve of Christ Mass. End of section twenty seven. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Section twenty eight of Women in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller Section 28. Children's Books There is no branch of literature that better deserves cultivation, 
and none that so little obtains it from worthy hands as this of children's books it requires a peculiar development of the genius and sympathies rare among men of factitious life who are not men enough to revive with force and beauty the thoughts and scenes of childhood it is all idle to talk baby talk and give shallow accounts of deep things thinking thereby to interest the child he does not like to be too much puzzled but it is simplicity he wants not silliness we fancy they are angels who are always waiting in the courts of our father smile somewhat sadly on the ignorance of those who would feed them on milk and water too long and think it would be quite as well to give them a stone there is too much amongst us of the french way of palming off false accounts of things on children to do them good and showing nature to them in a magic lantern purified for the use of childhood and telling stories of sweet little girls and brave little boys oh all so good or so bad and above all so little and everything about them so little children accustomed to move in full-size apartments and converse with full-grown men and women do not need so much of this baby-house style in their literature they like or would like if they could get them better things much more they like the arabian nights and pilgrim's progress and bunyan's emblems and shakespeare and the iliad and odyssey at least they used to like them and if they do not now it is because their taste has been injured by so many sugar-plums the books that were written in the childhood of nations suit an uncorrupted childhood now they are simple picturesque robust their moral is not forced nor is the truth veiled with a well-meant but sure to fail hypocrisy sometimes they are not moral at all only free plays of the fancy and intellect these also the child needs just as the infant needs to stretch its limbs and grasp at objects it cannot hold we have become so fond of the moral that we forget the nature in which it must find its root so fond of instruction that we forget development where ballads legends fairy tales are moral the morality is heartfelt if instructive it is from the healthy common sense of mankind and not for the convenience of nursery rule nor the peace of schools and families oh that winter freezing snow-laden winter which ushered in our eighth birthday there in the lonely farmhouse the day's work done and the bright wood-fire all in a glow we were permitted to slide back the panel of the cupboard in the wall most fascinating object still in our eyes with which no stateliest alcoved library can vie and there saw neatly ranged on its two shelves nod praised be our natal star peter parley nor a history of the good little boy who never took anything that did not belong to him but the spectator telemachus goldsmith's animated nature and the iliad forms of gods and heroes more distinctly seen and with eyes of nearer love than than now our true uncle sir roger de coverley and ye fair realms of nature's history whose pictures we tormented all grown persons to illustrate with more knowledge still more how we bless the chance that gave to us your great realities which life has daily helped us helps us still to interpret instead of thin and baseless fictions that would all this time have hampered us though with only cobwebs children need some childish talk some childish play some childish books but they also need and need more difficulties to overcome and a sense of the vast mysteries which the progress of their intelligence shall aid them to unravel this sense is naturally their delight as it is their religion and it must not be dulled by premature explanations or subterfuges of any kind 
there has been too much of this lately. Miss Edgeworth is an excellent writer for children. She is a child herself, as she writes, nursed anew by her own genius. It is not by imitating, but by reproducing childhood, that the writer becomes its companion. Then, indeed, we have something especially good, for, like wine well kept and long, heady nor harsh nor strong, with each succeeding year is quaffed a richer, purer, mellower draught. Miss Edgeworth's grown people live naturally with the children. They do not talk to them continually about angels or flowers, but about the things that interest themselves. They do not force them forward, nor keep them back. The relations are simple and honorable. All ages in the family seem at home under one roof and sheltered by one care. The Juvenile Miscellany, formerly published by Mrs. Child, was much and deservedly esteemed by children. It was a healthy, cheerful, natural, and entertaining companion to them. We should censure too monotonously tender a manner in what is written for children, and too constant an attention to moral influence. We should prefer a larger proportion of the facts of natural or human history, and that they should speak for themselves. End of section 28. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 29 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 29. Woman in Poverty. Woman, even less than man, is what she should be as a whole. She is not that self-centered being full of profound intuitions, angelic love, and flowing posy that she should be. Yet there are circumstances in which the native force and purity of her being teach her how to conquer where the restless impatience of man brings defeat and leaves him crushed and bleeding on the field. Images rise to mind of calm strength, of gentle wisdom learning from every turn of adverse fate, of youthful tenderness and faith undimmed to the close of life, which redeem humanity and make the heart glow with fresh courage as we write. They are mostly from obscure corners and very private walks. There was nothing shining, nothing of an obvious and sounding heroism to make their conduct doubtful by tainting their motives with vanity. Unknown they lived, untrumpeted they died. Many hearts were warmed and fed by them, but perhaps no mind but our own ever consciously took account of their virtues. Had art but the power adequately to tell their simple virtues, and to cast upon them the light which, shining through those marked and faded faces, foretold the glories of a second spring. The tears of holy emotion which fell from those eyes have seemed to us pearls beyond all price, or rather whose price will be paid only when, beyond the grave, they enter those better spheres in whose faith they felt enacted here. From this private gallery we will, for the present, bring forth but one picture. That of a black nun was wont to fetter the eyes of visitors in the royal galleries of France, and my sister of mercy, too, is of that complexion. The old woman was recommended as a laundress by my friend, who had long prized her. I was immediately struck with the dignity and propriety of her manner. In the depth of winter she brought herself the heavy baskets through the slippery streets, and, when I asked her why she did not employ some younger person to do what was so entirely disproportioned to her strength, simply said, she lived alone, and could not afford to hire an errand boy. Was it hard for her? No, she was fortunate in being able to get work at her age, when others could do it better. Her friends were very good to procure it for her. Had she a comfortable home? Tolerably so. She should not need one long. Was that a thought of joy to her? Yes, for she hoped to see again the husband and children from whom she had long been separated. Thus much in answer to the questions, 
but at other times the little she said was on general topics. It was not from her that I learnt how the great idea of duty had held her upright through a life of incessant toil, sorrow, bereavement, and that not only she had remained upright, but that her character had been constantly progressive. Her latest act had been to take home a poor sick girl who had no home of her own and could not bear the idea of dying in a hospital, and maintain and nurse her through the last weeks of her life. Her eyesight was failing, and she should not be able to work much longer, but then God would provide. Somebody ought to see to the poor motherless girl. It was not merely the greatness of the act for one in such circumstances, but the quiet, matter-of-course way in which it was done, that showed the habitual tone of the mind, and made us feel that life could hardly do more for a human being than to make him or her the somebody that is daily so deeply needed to represent the right, to do the plain right thing. God will provide. Yes, it is the poor who feel themselves near to the God of love. Though he slay them, still do they trust him. I hope, said I to a poor apple woman, who had been drawn on to disclose a tale of distress that, almost in mere hearing, made me weary of life, I hope I may yet see you in a happier condition. With God's help, she replied, with a smile that Raphael would have delighted to transfer to his canvas, a Mozart to strains of angelic sweetness. All her life she had seemed an outcast child, still she leaned upon a father's love. The dignity of a state like this may vary its form in more or less richness and beauty of detail, but here is the focus of what makes life valuable. It is this spirit which makes poverty the best servant to the ideal of human nature. I am content with this type, and will only quote in addition a ballad I found in a foreign periodical translated from Camiso, and which forcibly recalled my own laundress as an equally admirable sample of the same class the ideal poor, which we need for our consolation, so long as there must be real poverty. THE OLD WASHERWOMAN Among yon lines her hands have laden, a laundress with white hair appears, alert as many a youthful maiden, spite of her five-and-seventy years. Bravely she won those white hairs, still eating the bread hard toil obtained her, and laboring truly to fulfill the duties to which God ordained her. Once she was young and full of gladness. She loved and hoped, was wooed and won. Then came the matron's cares, the sadness no loving heart on earth may shun. Three babes she bore her mate. She prayed beside his sick bed. He was taken. She saw him in the churchyard laid, yet kept her faith and hope unshaken. The task her little ones of feeding she met unfaltering from that hour. She taught them thrift and honest breeding. Her virtues were their worldly dower. To seek employment one by one, forth with her blessing they departed, and she was in the world alone, alone and old, but still high-hearted. With frugal forethought, self-denying, she gathered coin and flax she bought, and many a night her spindle plying, good store of fine-spun thread she wrought. The thread was fashioned in the loom. She brought it home and calmly seated, to work with not a thought of gloom, her decent grave clothes she completed. She looks on them with fond elation. They are her wealth, her treasure rare, her age's pride and consolation, hoarded with all a miser's care. She dons the sark each Sabbath day, to hear the word that falleth never. Well pleased she lays it then away, till she shall sleep in it for ever. Would that my spirit witness bore me, that like this woman I had done the work my master put before me, duly from morn till set of sun. Would that life's cup had been by me, quaffed in such wise and happy measure, and that I too might finally look on my shroud with such meek pleasure. Such are the noble of the earth. They do not repine, they do not chafe, even in the inmost heart. They feel that whatever else may be denied or withdrawn, there remains the better part, which cannot be taken from them. This line exactly expresses the woman I knew. Alone and old, but still high-hearted. 
Will any, poor or rich, fail to feel that the children of such a parent were rich when her virtues were their worldly dower? Will any fail to bow the heart in assent to the aspiration? Would that my spirit witness bore me, that like this woman I had done the work my Maker put before me, duly from morn till set of sun? May not that suffice to any man's ambition? End of section 29 Recording by Patty Cunningham Section 30 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelia Potter. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women. By Margaret Fuller. Section 30. The Irish Character. Since the publication of a short notice under this head in the Tribune, Several persons have expressed to us that their feelings were awakened on the subject, especially as to their intercourse with the lower Irish. Most persons have an opportunity of becoming acquainted, if they will, with the lower classes of Irish, as they are so much employed among us in domestic service and other kinds of labor. We feel, say these persons, the justice of what has been said as to the duty and importance of improving these people. We have sometimes tried, but the want of real gratitude which, in them, is associated with such warm and wordy expressions of regard, with their incorrigible habits of falsehood and evasion, have baffled and discouraged us. You say their children ought to be educated, but how can this be effected when the all but omnipotent sway of the Catholic religion and the example of parents are both opposed to the formation of such views and habits as we think desirable to the citizen of the new world? We answer first with regard to those who have grown up in another land and who, soon after arriving here, are engaged in our service. First, as to ingratitude. We cannot but sadly smile on the remarks we hear so often on this subject. Just heaven, and to us how liberal, which has given those who speak thus an unfettered existence, free from religious or political oppression, which has given them the education of intellectual and refined intercourse with men to develop those talents, which make them rich in thoughts and enjoyment, perhaps in money too, certainly rich in comparison with the poor immigrants they employ. What is thought is thy clear light of those who expect in exchange for a few shillings spent in presents or medicines, a few kind words, a little casual thought or care, such a mighty payment of gratitude. Gratitude! Under the weight of feudalism, their minds were padlocked by habit against the light. They might be grateful then, for they thought their lords were as gods, of another fame and spirit than theirs, and that they had no right to have the same hopes and wants, scarcely to suffer from the same maladies, with those creatures of silk and velvet and cloth of gold. Then, the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table might be received with gratitude, and if any... But the dogs came to tend the beggar's sores. Such might be received as angels, but the institutions which sustain such ideas have fallen to pieces. It is understood, even in Europe, that the rank is but the guinea's stamp. The man, the gowd, for that. A man's a man for that. And being such, has a claim on this earth for something better than the nettles of which the French peasantry made their soup and with which the persecuted French, under hiding, turn to green the lips white before with famine. And if this begins to be understood in Europe, can you suppose it is not by those who, hearing that America opens a mother's arms with a cry, all men are born free and equal, rush to her bosom to be consoled for centuries of woe, for their ignorance, their hereditary degradation, their long memories of black bread and stripes, However, little else they may understand, believe they understand well this much. Such inequalities of privilege among men are born of one blood, should not exist. They darkly feel that those of whom much has been given owe to the master an account of stewardship. They know now that their gift is but a small portion of their right. And you, O oh giver, how did you give? With religious joy? As one who knows that he has loved, God cannot fail to love his neighbor as himself. With joy and freedom, 
as one who feels that it is the highest happiness of gift to us that we have something to give again? Didst thou put thyself into the position of the poor man and do for him what thou wouldst have had one who was able to do for thee? Or with affability and condescending sweetness, made easy by internal delight at thine own wondrous virtue. Didst thou give five dollars to balance five hundred spent on thyself? Did you say, James, I shall expect you to do right in everything and to attend to my concerns as I should myself, and at the end of the quarter I will give you my old clothes and a new pocket handkerchief, besides seeing that your mother is provided with fuel against Christmas. Line upon line, and precept upon precept, the tender parent expects from the teacher to whom he confides his child. Vigilance unwearied, day and night, through long years, but he expects the raw Irish girl or boy to correct, at a single exhortation, the habit of deceiving those above them, which the expectation of being tyrannized over has rooted in their race for ages. If we look fairly into the history of their people and the circumstances under which their own youth was trained, we cannot expect that anything short of the most steadfast patience and love can enlighten them as to the beauty and value of implicit truth, and having done so, fortify and refine them in the practice of it. This we admit at the onset. First, you must be prepared for a religious and patient treatment of these people, not merely uneducated, but ill-educated a treatment far more religious and patient than is demanded by your own children, if they were born and bred under circumstances at all favorable. Second, dismiss from your minds all thought of gratitude. Do what you do for them for God's sake and as a debt to humanity, interest to the common creditor upon principle left in your care. This insensibility, forgetfulness, or relapse will not discourage you, and you will welcome proofs of genuine attachment to yourself chiefly as tokens that your charge has risen into a higher state of thought and feeling, so as to be unable to value the benefits conferred through you. Could we begin so, there would be hope of our really becoming the instructors and guardians of this, of this swarm of souls, which come from their regions of torment to us, hoping at least the benefits of purgatory. The influence of the Catholic priesthood must continue very great till there is a complete transfusion of character in the minds of their charge. But as the Irishman, or any foreigner, becomes Americanized, he will demand a new form of religion to suit his n- new wants. The priest, too, will have to learn the duties of an American citizen. He will live less and less for the church and more for the people, till at last, if there be Catholicism, still, it will be under Protestant influences. As begins to be the case in Germany, it will be not Roman, but American Catholicism, a form of worship which relies much perhaps on external means and the authority of the clergy. For such will always be the case with religion, while there are crowds of men still living an external life and who have not learned to make full use of their own faculties. But where a belief in the benefits of confession and the power of the church, as church, to bind and loose, atone for or decide upon sin with similar corruptions, must vanish in the free and searching air of a new error. Between employer and employed, there is not sufficient pains taken on the part of the former to establish a mutual understanding. People meet in the relations of master and servant who have lived in two different worlds. In this respect, we are much worse situated than the same parties have been in Europe. There is less previous acquaintance between the upper and lower classes. We must, though unwillingly, use these terms to designate the state of things as at present existing. Meals are taken separately. Work is seldom shared. There is very little to bring the parties together except sometimes the farmer works with his hired Irish laborers in the field or the mother keeps the nursemaid of her baby in the room with her. In this state of things, the chances for instruction, which come every day of themselves where parties share a common life instead of its results merely, do not occur. Neither is there opportunity to administer instruction in the best manner, nor to understand when and where it is needed. The farmer who works with his men in the field The farmer's wife who attends with her women to the the churn and oven may, with ease, be true father and mother to all who are in their employ, and enjoy health of conscience in the relation, secure that, if they find cause for blame, it is not from faults induced by their own negligence. The merchant, 
who is from home all day, the lady receiving visitors or working slippers in her nicely furnished parlor, cannot be quite so sure that their demands or the duties involved in them are clearly understood, nor estimate the temptations or prevarication. It is shocking to think to what falsehoods human beings like ourselves will resort to excuse a love of amusement, to hide ill health, while they see us indulging freely in the one, yielding lightly to the other, and yet we have, or ought to have, far more resources in either temptation than they. For us, it is hard to resist to give up going to the places where we should meet our most interesting companions or to do work with our aching brow. But we have not people over us whose careless, hasty anger drives us to seek excuses for our failures. If so, perhaps, perhaps, who knows? We, the better educated, rigidly, immaculately true as we are at present, might tell falsehoods. Perhaps we might if things were given to us to do which we had never seen done. If we were surrounded by new arrangements in the nature of which no one instructed us, all this we might think of before we can be of much use. We have spoken of the nursery maid as the hired domestic with whom her mistress or even the master is likely to become acquainted. But only a day or two since we saw what we see so often, a nursery maid with the family to which she belongs, in a public conveyance. They were having a pleasant time, but in it she had no part, except to hold a hot heavy baby and receive frequent admonitions to keep it comfortable. No inquiry was made to her comfort, no entertaining remark, no information of interest as to the places we passed was addressed to her. Had she been in that way with the family ten years, she might have known them well enough, for their characters lay only too bare to the careless scrutiny. But her joys, her sorrows, her few thoughts, her almost buried capacities would have been as known to them, and they as little likely to benefit her as the Emperor of China." Let the employer place the employed first in good physical circumstances so as to promote the formation of different habits for those of the Irish hovel or the illicit still house. Having thus induced feelings or self-respect, he had opened the door for a new set of notations. Then let him become acquainted with the family circumstances and the history of his new pupil. He has now got some ground on which to stand for intercourse. Let instruction follow for the mind, not merely by having the youngest daughter set, now and then, copies in the writing book, or by hearing read aloud a few verses of, in the Bible, but by putting good books in their way. If able to read, and by intelligent conversation when there is a chance, the master with the man who is driving him, the lady of the woman who is making her bed, explain to them the relations of objects around them teach them to compare the old with the new life if you show a better way than theirs of doing work teach them too why it is better thus will the mind be prepared by development for a moral reformation there will be some soil fitted to receiving the seed when the time has come and will you think a poor uneducated person in whose mind the sense of right and wrong is confused the sense of honor blunted easier to access than one refined and thoughtful surely you will not if you yourself are refined and thoughtful but rather that the case requires far more care in the choices of favorable opportunity when then the good time has come Perhaps it will be best to do what you do in the way that will make a permanent impression. Show the Irishman that a vice not indigenous to his nation, for the rich and noble, who are not so tempted are chivalrous to an uncommon degree in, in their openness, bold sincerity, and adherence to their word, has crept over and become deeply rooted in the poor people from the long oppressions they have undergone. Show them that efforts and care will be needed to wash out the taint. Offer your aid, as a faithful friend, to watch their lapses and refine their sense of truth. You will not speak in vain. If they never mend, if habit is too powerful, still their noble nature will not have been addressed in vain. They will not forget the counsels they have not strength to follow, and the benefits will be seen in their children or their children's children. Many say, well, suppose we do this. What then? They are so fond of change, they will leave us. What then? Why, let them go, and carry the good seed elsewhere. Will you be as selfish and short-sighted as those who never plant trees or shade a hired house, lest someone else should be blessed by their shade? It is a simple duty we ask you to engage in. It is also a great patriotic work. We are asked to engage 
in a great work of mutual education, which must be for this country the system of mutual insurance. We have some hints upon this subject, drawn from the experience of the wise and good, some encouragement to offer from that experience that the fruits of a wise planting sometimes ripen sooner than we dare to expect. But this must be for another day. One word as to this love of change. We hear people blaming it in their servants who can and do go to Niagara, to the South, to the Springs, to Europe, to the seaside. In short, who are always on the move whenever they feel the need of variety to reanimate mind, health, or spirits. Change of place as to family employment, is the only way domestics have of seeing life, the only way immigrants have of getting thoroughly acquainted with the new society into which they have entered. How natural that they should incline to it. Once more, put yourself in their places, and then judge them gently from your own, if you would be just to them, if you would be of any use. End of section 30. Recording by Angelia Potter. Section 31 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 31. Educate Men and Women as Souls. Had Christendom been true to its standard, while accommodating its modes of operation to the calls of successive times, woman would now have not only equal power with man, for of that omnipotent nature will never suffer her to be defrauded, but a chartered power too fully recognized to be abused. Indeed, all that is wanting is that man should prove his own freedom by making her free. Let him abandon conventional restriction as a vestige of that oriental barbarity which confined women to a seraglio. Let him trust her entirely and give her every privilege already acquired for himself. Elective franchise, tenure of property, liberty to speak in public assemblies, etc., Nature has pointed out her ordinary sphere by the circumstances of her physical existence. She cannot wander far. If here and there the gods send their missives through women as through men, let them speak without remonstrance. In no age have men been able wholly to hinder them. A Deborah must always be a spiritual mother in Israel. A Corinna may be excluded from the Olympic Games. Yet all men will hear her song and a pinder sit at her feet. It is man's fault that there ever were Aspatia and Ninans. These exquisite forms were intended for the shrines of virtue. Neither need men fear to lose their domestic deities. Woman is born for love, and it is impossible to turn her from seeking it. Men should deserve her love as an inheritance rather than seize and guard it like a prey. Were they noble, they would strive rather not to be loved too much, and to turn her from idolatry to the true, the only love. Then, children of one father, they could not err nor misconceive one another. Society is now so complex that it is no longer possible to educate woman merely as woman. The tasks which come to her hand are so various, and so large a proportion of women are thrown entirely upon their own resources. I admit that this is not their state of perfect development, but it seems as if heaven, having so long issued its edict in poetry and religion, without securing intelligent obedience, now commanded the world in prose to take a high and rational view. The lesson reads to me thus. Sex, like rank, wealth, beauty, or talent, is but an accident of birth. As you would not educate a soul to be an aristocrat, so do not to be a woman. A general regard to her usual sphere is dictated in the economy of nature. You need never enforce these provisions rigorously. 
Achilles had long plied the distaff as a princess, yet at first sight of a sword he seized it. So with woman, one hour of love would teach her more of her proper relations than all your formulas and conventions. Express your views, men, of what you seek in women. Thus best do you give them laws. Learn, women, what you should demand of men. Thus only can they become themselves. Turn both from the contemplation of what is merely phenomenal in your existence to your permanent life as souls. Man, do not prescribe how the divine shall display itself in woman. Woman, do not expect to see all of God in man. Fellow pilgrims and helpmeets are ye, Apollo and Diana, twins of one heavenly birth, both beneficent and both armed. Man, fear not to yield to woman's hand, both the quiver and the lyre, for if her urn be filled with light, she will use both to the glory of God. There is but one doctrine for ye both, and that is the doctrine of the soul. End of section 31 Educate Men and Women as Souls Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 32 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Woman by Margaret Fuller Section 32 Journals and Letters, Part One. I like to listen to the soliloquies of a bright child. In this microcosm the philosophical observer may trace the natural progression of the mind of mankind. I often silently observe L with this view. He is generally imitative and dramatic. The day school, the singing school, or the evening party are acted out with admirable variety in the humours of the scene and great discrimination of character in its broader features. What is chiefly remarkable is his unconsciousness of his mental processes, and how thoughts it would be impossible for him to recall spring up in his mind like flowers and weeds in the soil. But to-night he was truly in a state of lyrical inspiration, his eyes flashing, his face glowing, and his whole composition chanted out in an almost metrical form. He began by mourning the death of a certain Harriet, whom he had let go to foreign parts, and who had died at sea. He described her as having blue sparkling eyes and a sweet smile, and lamented that he could never kiss her cold lips again. This part, which he continued for some time, was in prolonged cadences, and a low mournful tone, with a frequently recurring burden of, O oh, my Harriet, shall I never see thee more. Extract from Journal it is so true that a woman may be in love with a woman, and a man with a man. It is pleasant to be sure of it, because it is undoubtedly the same love that we shall feel when we are angels, when we ascend to the only fit place for the mignon, where sie fragen nicht nach Mann und Welb. It is regulated by the same law as that of love between persons of different sexes, only it is purely intellectual and spiritual unprefaced by any mixture of lower instincts, undisturbed by any need of consulting temporal interests. Its law is the desire of the spirit to realize a whole, which makes it seek in another being that which it finds not in itself. Thus the beautiful seek the strong, the mute seek the eloquent, the butterfly settles on the dark flower. Why did Socrates so love Alcibiades? Why did Kerner so love Schneider? How natural is the love of Wallenstein for Max, that of Madame de Stahl for de Recamier, mine for... Blank. I loved Blank for a time with as much passion as I was then strong to feel. Her face was always gleaming before me. Her voice was echoing in my ear. All poetic thoughts clustered round the dear image. This love was for me a key which unlocked many a treasure which I still possess. It was the carbuncle, emblematic gem, which cast light into many of the darkest corners of human nature. She loved me, too, 
though not so much, because her nature was less high, less grave, less large, less deep. But she loved more tenderly, less passionately. She loved me, for I well remember her suffering when she first could feel my faults, and knew one part of the exquisite veil rent away. How she wished to stay apart and weep the whole day. These thoughts were suggested by a large engraving representing Madame Recamier in her boudoir. I have so often thought over the intimacy between her and Madame de Stal. Madame Recamier is half reclining on a sofa. She is clad in white drapery, which clings very gracefully to her round but elegantly slender form. Her beautiful neck and arms are bare, her hair knotted up so as to show the contour of her truly feminine head to great advantage. A book lies carelessly on her lap, one hand yet holds it at the place where she left off reading. Her lovely face is turned towards us. She appears to muse on what she has been reading. When we see a woman in a picture with a book, she seems to be doing precisely that for which she was born. The book gives such an expression of purity to the female figure. A large window, partially veiled by a white curtain, gives a view of a city at some little distance. On one side stand the harp and piano, they are just books enough for a lady's boudoir. There is no picture, except one of Doré Camier herself as Corinne. This is absurd, but the absurdity is interesting, as recalling the connection. You imagine her to have been reading one of de Stahl's books, and to be now pondering what those brilliant words of her gifted friend can mean. Everything in the room is in keeping. Nothing appears to have been put there because other people have it, but there is nothing which shows a taste more noble and refined than you would expect from the fair Frenchwoman. All is elegant, modern, in harmony with the delicate habits and superficial culture which you would look for in its occupant. To Her Mother September 5, 1887 If I stay in Providence and more money is wanting than can otherwise be furnished, I will take a private class, which is ready for me, and by which, even if I reduced my terms to suit the place, I can earn the four hundred dollars that blank will need. If I do not stay, I will let her have my portion of our income with her own, or even capital which I have a right to take up, and come into this or some other economical place, and live at the cheapest rate. It will not be even a sacrifice to me to do so, for I am weary of society, and long for the opportunity for solitary concentration of thought. I know what I say. If I live you may rely upon me. God be with you, my dear mother. I am sure he will prosper the doings of so excellent a woman if you will only keep your mind calm and be firm. Trust your daughter, too. I feel increasing trust in mine own good mind. We will take good care of the children and of one another. Never fear to trouble me with your perplexities. I can never be so situated that I do not earnestly wish to know them. Besides, things do not trouble me as they did, for I feel within myself the power to aid, to serve. Most affectionately, your daughter, M. Part of Letter to M. Providence, October 7, 1838 For yourself, dear blank, you have attained an important age. No plan is desirable for you which is to be pursued with precision. The world, the events of every day which no one can predict, are to be your teachers, and you must in some degree give yourself up and submit to be led captive if you would learn from them. Principle must be at the helm, but thought must shift its direction with the winds and waves. Happy as you are thus far in worthy friends, you are not in much danger of rash intimacies or great errors. I think, upon the whole, quite highly of your judgment about people and conduct, for, though your first feelings are often extravagant, they are soon balanced. I do not know other faults in you besides that want of retirement of mind which I have before spoken of. If M and A want too much seclusion, there is nothing so fatal to the finer faculties as too ready or too extended a publicity. There is some danger lest there be no real religion in the heart which craves too much of daily sympathy. Through your mind the stream of life has coursed with such rapidity that it has often swept away the seed or loosened the roots of the young plants before they had ripened any fruit. I should think writing would be very good for you. 
a journal of your life and analyses of your thoughts, would teach you how to generalize, and give firmness to your conclusions. Do not write down merely that things are beautiful, or the reverse, but what they are and why they are beautiful or otherwise, and show these papers, at least at present, to nobody. Be your own judge and your own helper. Do not go too soon to any one with your difficulties, but try to clear them up for yourself. I think the course of reading you have fallen upon of late will be better for you than such books as you formerly read, addressed rather to the taste and imagination than the judgment. The love of beauty has rather an undue development in your mind. See now what it is and what it has been. Leave for a time the ideal, and return to the real. I should think two or three hours a day would be quite enough at present for you to give to books. Now learn buying and selling, keeping the house, directing the servants, all that will bring you worlds of wisdom if you keep it subordinate to the one grand aim of perfecting the whole being. And let your self-respect forbid you to do imperfectly anything that you do at all. I always feel ashamed when I write with this air of wisdom, but you will see by my hints what I mean. Your mind wants depth and precision, your character condensation. Keep your high aim steadily in view. Life will open the path to reach it. I think blank, even if she be in excess, is an excellent friend for you. Her character seems to have what yours wants, whether she has or has not found the right way. To her brother, A. B. F. Providence, February 19, 1838. My dear A., I wish you could see the journals of two dear little girls, eleven years old, in my school. They love one another just like Betsy Bell and Mary Gray in the ballad. They are just of a size, both lively as birds, affectionate, gentle, ambitious in good works and knowledge. They encourage one another constantly to do right. They are rivals, but never jealous of one another. One has the quicker intellect, the other is the prettier. I have never had occasion to find fault with either, and the forwardness of their minds has induced me to take both into my reading class, where they are associated with girls many years their elders. Particular pains do they take with their journals. These are written daily in a beautiful fair round hand, well composed, showing attention and memory well trained, with many pleasing sallies of playfulness, and some very interesting thoughts. To the Same Jamaica Plain, December twentieth, 1840 About your school I do not think I could give you much advice which would be of value, unless I could know your position more in detail. The most important rule is, in all relations with our fellow-creatures, never forget that, if they are imperfect persons, they are immortal souls, and treat them as you would wish to be treated by the light of that thought. As to the application of means, abstain from punishment as much as possible, and use encouragement as far as you can, without flattery. But be even more careful as to strict truth in this regard towards children than to persons of your own age. For to the child, the parent or the teacher is the representative of justice. And as that of life is severe, an education which in any degree excites vanity is the very worst preparation for that general and crowded school. I doubt not you will teach grammar well, as I saw you aimed at principles in your practice. In geography try to make pictures of the scenes, that they may be present to their imaginations, and the nobler faculties be brought into action as well as memory. In history try to study and paint the characters of great men. They best interpret the leadings of events amid the nations. I am pleased with your way of speaking of both people and pupils. Your view seems from the right point. Yet beware of over-great pleasure in being popular or even beloved. As far as an amiable disposition and powers of entertainment make you so, it is a happiness. But if there is one grain of plausibility, it is poison. But I will not play mentor too much, lest I make you averse to write to your very affectionate sister, M. To her brother, R. I entirely agree in what you say of tuition and intuition. The two must act and react upon one another to make a man, to form a mind. Drudgery is as necessary to call out the treasures of the mind as harrowing and planting those of the earth. And besides, the growths of literature and art are as much nature as the trees in conquered woods, but nature idealized and perfected. To the Same 1841 
I take great pleasure in that feeling of the living presence of beauty in nature which your letters show. But you, who have now lived long enough to see some of my prophecies fulfilled, will not deny, though you may not yet believe the truth of my words, when I say you go to an extreme in your denunciations of cities and the social institutions. These are a growth also, and, as well as the diseases which come upon them, under the control of the one spirit as much as the great tree on which the insects prey, and in whose bark the busy bird has made many a wound. When we get the proper perspective of these things, we shall find man, however artificial, still a part of nature. Meanwhile let us trust, and while it is the soul's duty ever to bear witness to the best it knows, let us not be hasty to conclude that in what suits us not there can be no good. Let us be sure there must be eventual good, could we but see far enough to discern it. In maintaining perfect truth to ourselves, and choosing that mode of being which suits us, we had best leave others alone as much as may be. You prefer the country, and I doubt not it is on the whole a better condition of life to live there. But at the country party you have mentioned, you saw that no circumstances will keep people from being frivolous. One may be gossiping and vulgar and idle in the country, earnest and noble and wise in the city. Nature cannot be kept from us while there is a sky above, with so much as one star to remind us of prayer in the silent night. As I walked home this evening at sunset over the mill-dam, towards the city, I saw very distinctly that the city also is a bed in God's garden. More of this some other time. To a Young Friend Concord, May 2, 1887 My dear, I am passing happy here except that I am not well, so unwell that I fear I must go home and ask my good mother to let me rest and vegetate beneath her sunny kindness for a while. The excitement of conversation prevents my sleeping. The drive here with Mr. E. was delightful. Dear nature and time, so often calumniated, will take excellent care of us if we will let them. The wisdom lies in schooling the heart not to expect too much. I did that good thing when I came here, and I am rich. On Sunday I drove to Watertown with the author of Nature. The trees were still bare, but the little birds care not for that. They revel and carol and wildly tell their hopes, while the gentle, voluble south wind plays with the dry leaves, and the pine trees sigh with their soul-like sounds for June. It was beauteous, and care and routine fled away, and I was as if they had never been, except that I vaguely whispered to myself that all had been well with me. The baby here is beautiful. He looks like his father, and smiles so sweetly on all hearty good people. I play with him a good deal, and he comes so natural, after Dante and other poets. Ever faithfully, your friend. To the Same, 1837 My beloved child, I was very glad to get your note. Do not think you must only write to your friends when you can tell them you are happy. They will not misunderstand you in the dark hour, nor think you forsaken, if cast down. Though your letter of Wednesday was very sweet to me, yet I knew it could not last as it was then. These hours of heavenly heroic strength leave us, but they come again. Their memory is with us amid after trials, and gives us a foretaste of that era when the steadfast soul shall be the only reality. My dearest, you must suffer, but you will always be growing stronger and with every trial nobly met you will feel a growing assurance that nobleness is not a mere sentiment with you. I sympathize deeply in your anxiety about your mother, yet I cannot but remember the bootless fear and agitation about my mother, and how strangely our destinies were guided. Take refuge in prayer when you are most troubled. The door of the sanctuary will never be shut against you. I send you a paper which is very sacred to me. Bless heaven that your heart is awakened to sacred duties before any kind of gentle ministering has become impossible, before any relation has been broken. Lines written in March, 1836 I will not leave you comfortless. O friend divine, this promise dear falls sweetly on the weary ear. Often in hours of sickening pain it soothes me to thy rest again. Might I a true disciple be, following thy footsteps faithfully, then should I still the succour prove of him who gave his life for love. When this fond heart would vainly beat, for bliss that ne'er on earth we meet, for perfect sympathy of soul, from those such heavy laws control, 
When, roused from passion's ecstasy, I see the dreams that filled it fly, Amid my bitter tears and sighs those gentle words before me rise. With aching brows and feverish brain the founts of intellect I drain, And con with over-anxious thought what poets sung and heroes wrought. Enchanted with their deeds and lays, I with like gems would deck my days. No fires creative in me burn, and humbled I to thee return. When blackest clouds around me rolled, of scepticism drear and cold, When love and hope and joy and pride forsook a spirit deeply tried, My reason wavered in that hour, prayer too impatient lost its power, from thy benignity a ray I caught and found the perfect day. A head revered in dust was laid, for the first time I watched my dead. The widow's sobs were checked in vain, and childhood's tears poured down like rain. In awe I gazed on that dear face, in sorrow years gone by retrace. When nearest duties most forgot I might have blessed and did it not. Ignorant his wisdom I reproved, heedless passed by what most he loved, knew not a life like his to prize of ceaseless toil and sacrifice. No tears can now that hushed heart move, no cares display a daughter's love, the fair occasion lost no more can thoughts more just to thee restore. What can I do, and how atone for all I've done and left undone? Tearful I search the parting words which the beloved John records. Not comfortless. I dry my eyes, my duties clear before me rise. Before thou think'st of taste or pride, see home affections satisfied. Be not with generous thoughts content, but on well-doing constant bent. When self seems dear, self-seeking fair, remember this sad hour in prayer. Though all thou wishest fly thy touch, Much can one do who loveth much. More of thy spirit, Jesus, give, Not comfortless, though sad to live. And yet not sad, if I can know, To copy him who here below Sought but to do his father's will, Though from such sweet composure Still my heart be far. Wilt thou not aid one Whose best hopes on thee are stayed, Breathe into me thy perfect love, and guide me to thy rest above. To her brother R. Mr. Keats, Emma's father, is dead. To me this brings unusual sorrow, though I have never yet seen him. But I thought of him as one of the very few persons known to me by reputation, whose acquaintance might enrich me. His character was a sufficient answer to the doubt whether a merchant can be a man of honour. He was, like your father, a man all whose virtues had stood the test. He was no word hero. To a Young Friend Providence, June 16, 1837 My dear Blank, I pray you, amid all your duties, to keep some hours to yourself. Do not let my example lead you into excessive exertions. I pay dear for extravagance of this sort. Five years ago I had no idea of the languor and want of animal spirits which torment me now. Animal spirits are not to be despised. An earnest mind and seeking heart will not often be troubled by despondency. But unless the blood can dance at proper times, the lighter passages of life lose all their refreshment and suggestion. I wish you and Blank had been here last Saturday. Our schoolhouse was dedicated, and Mr. Emerson made the address. It was a noble appeal in behalf of the best interests of culture, and seemingly here was fit occasion. The building was beautiful, and furnished with an even elegant propriety. I am at perfect liberty to do what I please, and there are apparently the best dispositions, if not the best preparation, on the part of the hundred and fifty young minds with whom I am to be brought in contact. I sigh for the country. Trees, birds, and flowers assure me that June is here but I must walk through streets many and long to get sight of any expanse of green. I had no fine weather while at home, though the quiet and rest were delightful to me. The sun did not shine once really warmly, nor did the apple-trees put on their blossoms until the very day I came away. Sonnet 
to the same. Although the sweet still watches of the night find me all lonely now, yet the delight hath not quite gone, which from thy presence flows. The love, the joy that in thy bosom glows, lingers to cheer thy friend. From thy fresh dawn some golden exhalations have I drawn, to make less dim my dusty noon. Thy tones are with me still, some plaintive as the moans of dryads, when their native groves must fall. Some wildly wailing, like the clarion call, on battlefield, strewn with the noble dead. Some in soft romance, like the echoes bred in the most secret groves of Arcady. Yet all, wild, sad, or soft, how steeped in poesy. Providence, April 1838 End of section 32《三国志》Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Woman in the Nineteenth Century, and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women, by Margaret Fuller. Section 33. Journals and Letters, Part Two. To the Same. Providence, October twenty first, eighteen thirty eight. I am reminded by what you say of an era in my own existence. It is seven years by gone. For bitter months a heavy weight had been pressing on me, the weight of deceived friendship. I could not be much alone, a great burden of family cares pressed upon me. I was in the midst of society and obliged to act my part there as well as I could. At that time I took up the study of German, and my progress was like the rebound of a string pressed almost to bursting. My mind being then in the highest state of action, heightened by intellectual appreciation every pang, and imagination by prophetic power gave to the painful present all the weight of as painful a future. At this time I never had any consolation, except in long, solitary walks, and my meditations then were so far aloof from common life that on my return my fall was like that of the eagle, which the sportsman's hand calls bleeding from his lofty flight, to stain the earth with his blood. In such hours we feel so noble, so full of love and bounty, that we cannot conceive how any pain should have been needed to teach us. It then seems we are so born for good that such means of leading us to it were wholly unnecessary. But I have lived to know that the secret of all things is pain, and that nature travaileth most painfully with her noblest product. I was not without hours of deep spiritual insight, and consciousness of the inheritance of vast powers. I touched the secret of the universe, and by that touch was invested with talismanic power which has never left me though it sometimes lies dormant for a long time. One day lives always in my memory, one chastest, heavenliest day of communion with the soul of things. It was Thanksgiving Day. I was free to be alone, in the meditative woods, by the choked-up fountain. I passed its hours, each of which contained ages of thought and emotion. I saw then how idle were my griefs, that I had acquired the thought of each object which had been taken from me, that more extended personal relations would only have given me pleasures which then seemed not worth my care, and which would surely have dimmed my sense of the spiritual meaning of all which had passed. I felt how true it was that nothing in any being which was fit for me could long be kept from me, and that, if separation could be, real intimacy had never been. All the films seemed to drop from my existence, and I was sure that I should never starve in this desert world, but that manna would drop from heaven, if I would but rise with every rising sun to gather it. In the evening I went to the churchyard. The moon sailed above the rosy clouds. The crescent moon rose above the heavenward pointing spire. At that hour a vision came upon my soul, whose final scene last month interpreted. The rosy clouds of illusion are all vanished. The moon has waxed to full. May my life be a church, full of devout thoughts and solemn music. I pray thus, my dearest child. Our Father, let not the heaviest shower be spared, 
let not the gardener forbear his knife till the fair hopeful tree of existence be brought to its fullest blossom and fruit. To the Same Jamaica Plain, June, 1839 I have had a pleasant visit at Nahant, but was no sooner there than the air braced me so violently as to drive all the blood to my head. I had headache two of the three days we were there, and yet I enjoyed my stay very much. We had the rocks and piazzas to ourselves, and we were on sufficiently good terms not to destroy, if we could not enhance one another's pleasure. The first night we had a storm, and the wind roared and wailed round the house that Ossianic poetry of which you hear so many strains. Next day was clear and brilliant with a high northwest wind. I went out about six o'clock, and had a two hours' scramble before breakfast. I do not like to sit still in this air, which exasperates all my nervous feelings, but when I can exhaust myself in climbing I feel delightfully. The eye is so sharpened, and the mind so full of thought. The outlines of all objects, the rocks, the distant sails, even the rippling of the ocean were so sharp that they seemed to press themselves into the brain. When I see a natural scene by such a light it stays in my memory always as a picture. On milder days it influences me more in the way of reverie. After breakfast we walked on the beaches. It was quite low tide, no waves, and the fine sand eddying wildly about. I came home with that frenzied headache which you are so unlucky as to know, covered my head with wet towels and went to bed. After dinner I was better and we went to the spouting horn. C was perched close to the fisher, far above me, and in a pale green dress she looked like the nymph of the place. I lay down on a rock low in the water, where I could hear the twin harmonies of the sucking of the water into the spout, and the washing of the surge on the foot of the rock. I never passed a more delightful afternoon. Clouds of pearl and amber were slowly drifting across the sky, or resting a while to dream, like me, near the water. Opposite me at considerable distance was a line of rock, along which the billows of the advancing tide chased one another, and leaped up exultingly as they were about to break. That night we had a sunset of the gorgeous autumnal kind, and in the evening very brilliant moonlight, but the air was so cold I could enjoy it but a few minutes. Next day, which was warm and soft, I was out on the rocks all day. In the afternoon I was out alone, and had an admirable place, a cleft between two vast towers of rock with turret-shaped tops. I got on a ledge of rock at their foot, where I could lie and let the waves wash up around me, and look up at the proud turrets rising into the prismatic light. This evening was very fine, all the sky covered with crowding clouds, profound but not sullen of mood the moon wading, the stars peeping, the wind sighing very softly. We lay on the high rocks and listened to the plashing of the waves. The next day was good, but the keen light was too much for my eyes and brain. And though I am glad to have been there, I am as glad to get back to our garlanded rocks and richly green fields and groves. I wish you could come to me now. We have such wealth of roses. To the same. Jamaica Plain, August, 1839. I returned home well, full of earnestness. Yet I know not why, with the sullen, boding sky came a mood of sadness, nay of gloom, black as Hades, which I have vainly striven to fend off by work, by exercise, by high memories. Very glad was I of a painful piece of intelligence which came the same day with your letter, to bring me an excuse for tears. That was a black Friday both above and within. What demon resists our good angel and seems at such times to have the mastery? Only seems, I say to myself, it is but the sickness of the immortal soul, and shall by and by be cast aside like a film. I think this is the great step of our life, to change the nature of our self-reliance. We must find that the will cannot conquer circumstances, and that our temporal nature must vary its hue here with the food that is given it. Only out of mulberry leaves will the silkworm spin its thread fine and durable. The mode of our existence is not in our own power, but behind it is the immutable essence that cannot be tarnished, and to hold fast to this conviction, to live as far as possible by its light, cannot be denied us if we elect this kind of self-trust. Yet is sickness wearisome, and I rejoice to say that my demon seems to have been frightened away by this day's sun. 
but, conscious of these diseases of the mind, believe that I can sympathize with a friend when subject to the same. Do not fail to go and stay with blank. Few live so penetrating and yet so kind, so true, so sensitive. She is the spirit of love as well as of intellect. To the same. My beloved child, I confess I was much disappointed when I first received your letter this evening. I have been quite ill for two or three days, and looked forward to your presence as a restorative. But think not I would have had you act differently. Far better is it for me to have my child faithful to duty than even to have her with me. Such was the lesson I taught her in a better hour. I am abashed to think how often lately I have found excuses for indolence in the weakness of my body. While now, after solitary communion with my better nature, I feel it was weakness of mind, weak fear of depression and conflict. But the Father of our spirits will not long permit a heart fit for worship. To seek from weak recoils, exemptions weak, after false gods to go astray, deck altars vile with garlands gay, etc. His voice has reached me, and I trust the postponement of your visit will give me space to nerve myself to what strength I should, so that when we do meet I shall rejoice that you did not come to help or soothe me for I shall have helped and soothed myself. Indeed, I would not so willingly that you should see my shortcomings as know that they exist. Pray that I may never lose sight of my vacation, that I may not make ill health a plea for sloth and cowardice. Pray that, whenever I do, I may be punished more swiftly than this time by a sadness as deep as now. To her brother R. Cambridge, August 6, 1842. My dear R., I want to hear how you enjoyed your journey, and what you think of the world as surveyed from mountain-tops. I exceedingly enjoy staying among the mountains. I am satisfied with reading these bolder lines in the manuscript of nature. Merely gentle and winning scenes are not enough for me. I wish my lot had been cast amid the sources of the streams, where the voice of the hidden torrent is heard by night, where the eagle soars and the thunder resounds in long peals from side to side where the grasp of a more powerful emotion has rent asunder the rocks, and the long purple shadows fall like a broad wing upon the valley. All places, like all persons, I know have beauty, but only in some scenes and with some people can I expand and feel myself at home. I feel all this the more for having passed my earlier life in such a place as Cambridgeport. There I had nothing except the little flower-garden behind the house and the elms before the door. I used to long and sigh for beautiful places such as I read of. There was not one walk for me except over the bridge. I liked that very much, the river and the city glittering in sunset, and the lively undulating line all round, and the light smokes, seen in some weather. Letter to the Same Milwaukee, July twenty ninth, 1848 Dear R., daily I thought of you during my visit to the Rock River Territory. It is only five years since the poor Indians have been dispossessed of this region of sumptuous loveliness, such as can hardly be paralleled in the world. No wonder they poured out their blood freely before they would go. On one island, belonging to a Mr. H., with whom we stayed, are still to be found their cash for secreting provisions. The wooden troughs in which they pounded their corn, the marks of their tomahawks upon felled trees. When he first came he found the body of an Indian woman in a canoe, elevated on high poles, with all her ornaments on. This island is a spot where nature seems to have exhausted her invention in crowding it with all kinds of growths, from the richest trees down to the most delicate plants. It divides the river which there sweeps along in clear and glittering current, between noble parks, richest green lawns, pictured rocks crowned with old hemlocks, or smooth bluffs, three hundred feet high, the most beautiful of all. Two of these, the eagle's nest and the deer's walk, still the resort of the grand and beautiful creatures from which they are named, were the scene of some of the happiest hours of my life. I had no idea from verbal description of the beauty of these bluffs, nor can I hope to give any to others. They lie so magnificently bathed in sunlight, they touch the heavens with so sharp and fair a line. This is one of the finest parts of the river, but it seems beautiful enough to fill any heart and eye all along its course, nowhere broken or injured by the hand of man. And there, I thought, if we two could live, and you could have a farm which would not cost a twentieth part the labour of a New England farm, and would pay twenty times as much for the labour, and have our books and our pens and a little boat on the river, 
how happy we might be for four or five years, at least as happy as fate permits mortals to be. For we, I think, are congenial, and if I could hope permanent peace on the earth, I might hope it with you. You will be glad to hear that I feel overpaid for coming here. Much is my life enriched by the images of the great Niagara, of the vast lakes, of the heavenly sweetness of the prairie scenes, and above all by the heavenly region where I would so gladly have lived. My health, too, is materially benefited. I hope to come back better fitted for toil and care, as well as with beauteous memories to sustain me in them. Affectionately always, etc. To Miss R. Chicago, August 4, 1848. I have hoped from time to time, dear Blank, that I should receive a few lines from you, apprising me how you are this summer, but a letter from Mrs. F. lately comes to tell me that you are not better, but at least when at Saratoga, worse. So writing is of course fatiguing, and I must not expect letters any more. To that I could make up my mind if I could hear that you were well again. I fear if your malady disturbs you as much as it did, it must wear on your strength very much, and it seems in itself dangerous. However, it is good to think that your composure is such that disease can only do its legitimate work, and not undermine two ways, the body with its pains, and the body through the mind with thoughts and fears of pains. I should have written to you long ago except that I find little to communicate this summer, and little inclination to communicate that little. So what letters I have sent have been chiefly to beg some from my friends. I have had homesickness sometimes here, as do children for the home where they are even little indulged, in the boarding-school where they are only tolerated. This has been in the town, where I have felt the want of companionship, because the dissipation of fatigue, or expecting soon to move again, has prevented my employing myself for myself. And yet there was nothing well worth looking at without. When in the country I have enjoyed myself highly, and my health has improved day by day. The characters of persons are brought out by the little wants and adventures of country life as you see it in this region, so that each one awakens a healthy interest. And the same persons who, if I saw them at these hotels, would not have a word to say that could fix the attention, become most pleasing companions. Their topics are before them and they take the hint. You feel so grateful, too, for the hospitality of the log cabin, such gratitude as the hospitality of the rich, however generous, cannot inspire. For these wait on you with their domestics and money, and give of their superfluity only. But here the master gives you his bed, his horse, his lamp, his grain from the field, his all, in short, and you see that he enjoys doing so thoroughly, and takes no thought for the morrow, so that you seem in fields full of lilies perfumed with pure kindness, and feel verily that Solomon in all his glory could not have entertained you so much to the purpose. Travelling, too, through the wide green woods and prairies gives a feeling both of luxury and repose that the sight of highly cultivated country never can. There seems to be room enough for labour to pause and man to fold his arms and gaze, forgetting poverty and care, and the thousand walls and fences that in the cultivated region must be built and daily repaired both for mind and body. Nature seems to have poured forth her riches so without calculation, merely to mark the fullness of her joy, to swell in larger strains the hymn, The one spirit doeth all things veil, for its life is love. I will not ask you to write to me, as I shall soon be at home. Probably, too, I shall reserve a visit to B for another summer. I have been so much a rover that when once on the road I shall wish to hasten home. Ever yours, M. To the same. Cambridge, January twenty first, 1844. My dear, I am anxious to get a letter telling me how you fare this winter in the cottage. Your neighbours who come this way do not give very favourable accounts of your looks, and if you are well enough I should like to see a few of those firm, well-shaped characters from your own hand. Is there no chance of your coming to Boston all this winter? I had hoped to see you for a few hours at least. I wrote you one letter while at the West. I know not if it was ever received. It was sent by a private opportunity, one of those traps to catch the unwary, as they have been called. It was no great loss, if lost. I did not feel like writing letters while travelling. It took all my strength of mind to keep moving and to receive so many new impressions. Surely I never had so clear an idea before of the capacity to bless of mere earth when fresh from the original breath of the creative spirit. To have this impression, one must see large tracts of wild country. 
where the traces of man's inventions are too few and slight to break the harmony of the first design. It will not be so long, even where I have been now. In three or four years those vast flowery plains will be broken up for tillage, those shapely groves converted into logs and boards. I wished I could have kept on now for two or three years, while yet the first spell rested on the scene. I feel much refreshed, even by this brief intimacy with nature in an aspect of large and unbroken lineaments. I came home with a treasure of bright pictures and suggestions, and seemingly well. But my strength, which had been sustained by a free, careless life in the open air, has yielded to the chills of winter, and a very little work with an ease that is not encouraging. However, I have had the influenza, and that has been about as bad as fever to everybody. Now I am pretty well, but much writing does not agree with me. I wish you were near enough for me to go in and see you now and then. I know that, sick or well, you are always serene, and sufficient to yourself. But now you are so much shut up, it might animate existence agreeably to hear some things I might have to tell. To the same. 1844. Just as I was beginning to visit the institutions here of a remedial and benevolent kind, I was stopped by influenza. So soon as I am quite well I shall resume the survey. I do not expect to do much practically for the suffering, but having such an organ of expression as the Tribune, any suggestions that are well grounded may be of use. I have always felt great interest for those women who are trampled in the mud to gratify the brute appetites of men, and I wished I might be brought naturally into contact with them. Now I am so, and I think I shall have much that is interesting to tell you when we meet. I go on very moderately, for my strength is not great, but I am now connected with a person who is anxious I should not overtask it. I hope to do more for the paper by and by. At present, besides the time I spend in looking round and examining my new field, I am publishing a volume, of which you will receive a copy, called Woman in the Nineteenth Century. A part of my available time is spent in attending to it as it goes through the press, for really the work seems but half done when your book is written. I like being here. The streams of life flow free, and I learn much. I feel so far satisfied as to have laid my plans to stay a year and a half, if not longer, and to have told Mr. G. that I shall probably do so. That is long enough for a mortal to look forward, and not too long, as I must look forward in order to get what I want from Europe. Mr. Greeley is a man of genuine excellence, honourable, benevolent, of an uncorrupted disposition, and of great abilities. In modes of life and manners he is a man of the people, and of the American people. I rejoice to hear that your situation is improved. I hope to pass a day or two with you next summer, if you can receive me when I come. I want to hear from you now and then, if it be only a line to let me know the state of your health. Love to Miss G., and tell her I have the cologne bottle on my mantelpiece now. I sent home for all the little gifts I had from friends, that my room might look more homelike. My window commands a most beautiful view, for we are quite out of the town, in a lovely place on the East River. I like this, as I can be in town when I will, and have here much retirement. You were right in supposing my signature is the star. Ever affectionately yours. To her brother R. Fishkill Landing, November 28, 1844. Dear R., the seven weeks of proposed abode here draw to a close, and I have brought what is rarest, fruition, of the sort proposed from them. I have been here all the time, except that three weeks since I went down to New York, and with blank visited the prison at Sing Sing. On Saturday we went up to Sing Sing in a little way-boat, thus seeing that side of the river to much greater advantage than we can in the mammoth boats. We arrived in resplendent moonlight, by which we might have supposed the prison's palaces, if we had not known too well what was within. On Sunday blank addressed the male convict in a strain of most noble and pathetic eloquence. They listened with earnest attention. Many were moved to tears. Some, I doubt not, to a better life. I never felt such sympathy with an audience. As I looked over that sea of faces marked with the traces of every ill, I felt that at least heavenly truth would not be kept out by self-complacency and a dependence on good appearances. I talked with a circle of women, and they showed the natural aptitude of the sex for refinement. These women, some black and all from the lowest haunts of vice, showed a sensibility and a sense of propriety which would not have disgraced any place. Returning we had a fine storm on the river, 
clearing up with strong winds. End of section 33「Section 34 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 34 Journals and Letters, Part Three. To her brother, A. B. F. Rome, January twentieth, 1849. My dear A., your letter and mother's gave me the first account of your illness. Some letters were lost during the summer, I do not know how. It did seem very hard upon you to have that illness just after your settlement. But it is to be hoped we shall sometime know a good reason for all that seems so strange. I trust you are now becoming fortified in your health, and if this could only be, feel as if things would go well with you in this difficult world. I trust you are on the threshold of an honourable and sometimes happy career. From many pains, many dark hours, let none of the progeny of Eve hope to escape. Meantime I hope to find you in your home and make you a good visit there. Your invitation is sweet in its tone, and rouses a vision of summer woods and New England Sunday morning bells. It seems to me that mother is at last truly in her sphere, living with one of her children. Watch over her carefully, and don't let her do too much. Her spirit is only all too willing, but the flesh is weak, and her life so precious to us all. To Mazzini Al cittadino representante del popolo romano Rome, March 8, 1849 Dear Mazzini, Though knowing you occupied by the most important affairs, I again feel impelled to write a few lines. What emboldens me is the persuasion that the best friends, in point of sympathy and intelligence, the only friends of a man of ideas and of marked character, must be women. You have your mother, no doubt you have others, perhaps many. Of that I know nothing. Only I like to offer also my tribute of affection. When I think that only two years ago you thought of coming into Italy with us in disguise, it seems very glorious that you are about to enter Republican Rome as a Roman citizen. It seems almost the most sublime and poetical fact of history. Yet even in the first thrill of joy I felt he will think his work but beginning now. When I read from your hand these words, Il lungo esilio teste ricominciato, la vita non confortata, furo che da fetti lontani, e contessi, e la speranza lungamente protratta, e il desiderio che comincia a farmi si supremo, di dormire finalmente in pace, da che non ho potuto vivere in terra mia. When I read these words they made me weep bitterly, and I thought of them always with a great pang at the heart. But it is not so, dear Mazzini. You do not return to sleep under the sod of Italy, but to see your thoughts springing up all over the soil. The gardeners seem to me, in point of instinctive wisdom or deep thought, most incompetent to the care of the garden. But an idea like this will be able to make use of any implements. The necessity, it is to be hoped, will educate the men by making them work. It is not this, I believe, which still keeps your heart so melancholy, for I seem to read the same melancholy in your answer to the Roman assembly. You speak of few and late years, but some full ones still remain. A century is not needed, nor should the same man in the same form of thought work too long on an age. He would mould and bind it too much to himself. Better for him to die and return incarnated to give the same truth on yet another side. Jesus of Nazareth died young, but had he not spoken and acted as much truth as the world could bear in his time? A frailty, a perpetual shortcoming in motion and curve line seems the destiny of this earth. The excuse awaits us elsewhere. There must be one, for it is true, as said Goethe, care is taken that the tree grow not up into the heavens. Men like you, appointed ministers, must not be less earnest in their work. Yet to the greatest, the day, the moment, is all their kingdom. God takes care of the increase. Farewell. 
For your sake I could wish at this moment to be an Italian and a man of action. But though I am an American, I am not even a woman of action. So the best I can do is to pray with the whole heart, Heaven bless dear Mazzini, cheer his heart, and give him worthy helpers to carry out his holy purposes. To Mr. and Mrs. Spring Florence, December 12, 1840 Dear M. and R., your letter, dear R., was written in your noblest and most womanly spirit. I thank you warmly for your sympathy about my little boy. What he is to me even you can hardly dream. You that have three, in whom the natural thirst of the heart was earlier satisfied, can scarcely know what my one ewe lamb is to me. That he may live, that I may find bread for him, that I may not spoil him by overweening love, that I may grow daily better for his sake are the ever-recurring thoughts say prayers, that give their hue to all the current of my life. But in answer to what you say, that it is still better to give the world a living soul than a portion of my life in a printed book, it is true. And yet of my book I could know whether it would be some worth or not. Of my child I must wait to see what his worth will be. I play with him, my ever-growing mystery. But from the solemnity of the thoughts he brings is refuge only in God. Was I worthy to be parent of a soul, with its eternal immense capacity for weal and woe? God be merciful to me, a sinner, come so naturally to a mother's heart. What you say about the peace way is deeply true. If any one see clearly how to work in that way, let him in God's name. Only if he abstain from fighting against great wrongs, let him be sure that he really is and ardently at work undermining them, or better still, sustaining the rights that are to supplant them. Meanwhile I am not sure that I can keep my hands free from blood. Cobden is good, but if he had stood in Cossuth's place, would he not have drawn his sword against the Austrian? You! Could you let a croat insult your wife, carry off your son to be an Austrian serf, and leave your daughter bleeding in the dust? Yet it is true that while Moses slew the Egyptian, Christ stood still to be spit upon, and it is true that death to man could do him no harm. You have the truth, you have the right, but could you act up to it in all circumstances? Stifled under the Roman priesthood, would you not have thrown it off with all your force? Would you have waited unknown centuries, hoping for the moment when you could see another method? Yet the agonies of that baptism of blood I feel, oh, how deeply, in the golden June days of Rome! Consistent no way, I felt I should have shrunk back, I could not have had it shed. Christ did not have to see his dear ones pass the dark river. He could go alone, however, in prophetic spirit. No doubt he foresaw the Crusades. In answer to what you say of blank, I wish the little effort I made for him had been wisely or applied. Yet these are not the things one regrets. It does not do to calculate too closely with the affectionate human impulse. We must be content to make many mistakes, or we should move too slowly to help our brothers much. To her brother R. Florence, January eighth, eighteen fifty. My dear R., the way in which you speak of my marriage is such as I expected from you. Now that we have once exchanged words on these important changes in our lives, it matters little to write letters. So much has happened, and the changes are too great to be made clear in writing. It would not be worth while to keep the family thinking of me. I cannot fix precisely the period of my return, though at present it seems to me probable we may make the voyage in May or June. At first we should wish to go and make a little visit to mother. I should take counsel with various friends before fixing myself in any place, see what openings there are for me, etc. I cannot judge at all, before I am personally in the United States, and wish to engage myself no way. Should I finally decide on the neighborhood of New York, I should see you all often. I wish, however, to live with mother, if possible. We will discuss it on all sides when I come. Climate is one thing I must think of. The change from the Roman winter to that of New England might be very trying for us all. In New York he would see Italians often, hear his native tongue, and feel less exiled. If we had our affairs in New York and lived in the neighboring country, we could find places as quiet as sea, more beautiful, and from which access to a city would be as easy by means of steam. On the other hand, my family and most cherished friends are in New England. I shall weigh all advantages at the time and choose as may then seem best. I feel also the great responsibility about a child, and the mixture of solemn feeling with the joys its sweet ways and caresses give. 
yet this is only different in degree, not in kind, from what we should feel in other relations. We may more or less impede or brighten the destiny of all with whom we come in contact. Much as the child lies in our power, still God and nature are there, furnishing a thousand masters to correct our erroneous, and fill up our imperfect teachings. I feel impelled to try for good, for the sake of my child most powerfully. But if I fail I trust help will be tendered to him from some other quarter. I do not wish to trouble myself more than is inevitable, or lose the simple innocent pleasure of watching his growth from day to day by thinking of his future. At present my care of him is to keep him pure in body and mind, to give for body and mind simple nutriment when he requires it, and to play with him. Now he learns playing as we all shall when we enter a higher existence. With him my intercourse thus far has been precious, and if I do not well for him, he at least has taught me a great deal. I may say of a Soli it would be difficult to help liking him, so sweet is his disposition, so disinterested without effort, so simply wise his daily conduct, so harmonious his whole nature. He is a perfect unconscious character, and never dreams that he does well. He is studying English, but makes little progress. For a good while you may not be able to talk freely with him, but you will like showing him your favourite haunts. He is so happy in nature, so sweet in tranquil places. To blank. What a difference it makes to come home to a child! How it fills up all the gaps of life just in the way that is most consoling, most refreshing! Formerly I used to feel sad at that hour. The day had not been nobly spent. I had not done my duty to myself or others, and I felt so lonely. Now I never feel lonely. For even if my little boy dies, our souls will remain eternally united. And I feel infinite hope for him. Hope that he will serve God and man more loyally than I have done, and seeing how full he is of life, how much he can afford to throw away. I feel the inexhaustibleness of nature, and console myself for my own incapacities. Madame Arconati is near me. We have had some hours of great content together, but in the last weeks her only child has been dangerously ill. I have no other acquaintance except in the American circle, and should not care to make any unless singularly desirable, for I want all my time for the care of my child, for my walks and visits to objects of art, in which again I can find pleasure, and in the evening for study and writing. Asali is forming some taste for books. He is also studying English. He learns of Horace Sumner, to whom he teaches Italian in turn. To Mr. and Mrs. S. Florence, February 6, 1850. My dear M. and R., you have no doubt ere this received a letter written, I think, in December, but I must suddenly write again to thank you for the New Year's letter. It was a sweet impulse that led you all to write together, and had its full reward in the pleasure you gave. I have said as little as possible about Asali and our relation, wishing my old friends to form their own impressions naturally when they see us together. I have faith that all who ever knew me will feel that I have become somewhat milder, kinder, and more worthy to serve all who need for my new relations. I have expected that those who have cared for me chiefly for my activity of intellect would not care for him, but that those in whom the moral nature predominates would gradually learn to love and admire him, and see what a treasure his affection must be to me. But even that would be only gradually, for it is by acts, not by words, that one so simple, true, delicate, and retiring can be known. For me, while some of my friends have thought me exacting, I may say a soli has always outgone my expectations in the disinterestedness, the uncompromising bounty of his every act. He was the same to his father as to me. His affections are few but profound, and thoroughly acted out. His permanent affections are few, but his heart is always open to the humble, suffering, heavy-laden. His mind has little habitual action, except in a simple natural poetry, that one not very intimate with him would never know anything about but once opened to a great impulse, as it was to the hope of freeing his country, it rises to the height of the occasion and stays there. His enthusiasm is quiet but unsleeping. He is very unlike most Italians, but very unlike most Americans, too. I do not expect all who cared for me to care for him, nor is it of importance to him that they should. He is wholly without vanity. He is too truly the gentleman not to be respected by all persons of refinement. 
For the rest, if my life is free and not too much troubled, if he can enjoy his domestic affections and fulfil his duties in his own way, he will be content. Can we find this much for ourselves in bustling America the next three or four years? I know not, but think we shall come and try. I wish much to see you all, and exchange the kiss of peace. There will, I trust, be peace within if not without. I thank you most warmly for your gift. Be assured it will turn to great profit. I have learned to be great adept in economy by looking at my little boy. I cannot bear to spend a cent for fear he may come to want. I understand now how the family men get so mean, and shall have to begin soon to pray against that danger. My little Nino, as we call him for house and pet name, is in perfect health. I wash and dress and sew for him, and think I see a great deal of promise in his little ways, and shall know him all better for doing all for him, though it is fatiguing and inconvenient at times. He is very gay and laughing, sometimes violent, for he has come to the age when he wants everything in his own hands, but on the whole sweet as yet, and very fond of me. He often calls me to kiss him. He says kiss in preference to the Italian word baccio. I do not cherish sanguine visions about him, but try to do my best by him, and enjoy the present moment. It was a nice account you gave of Miss Bremer. She found some neighbours as good as her own. You say she was much pleased by blank. Could she know her, she might enrich the world with a portrait as full of little delicate traits as any in her gallery, and of a higher class than any in which she has been successful. I would give much that a competent person should paint. It is a shame she should die and leave the world no copy. To Mr. Cass, Charge d'Affaires des États-Unis d'Amérique. Florence, May 2, 1850. Dear Mr. Cass, I shall most probably leave Florence and Italy the eighth or tenth of this month, and am not willing to depart without saying adieu to yourself. I wanted to write the 30th of April, but a succession of petty interruptions prevented. That was the day I saw you first and the day the French first assailed Rome. What a crowded day that was! I had been to visit Ossoli in the morning, in the garden of the Vatican. Just after my return you entered. I then went to the hospital, and there passed the eight amid the groans of many suffering and some dying men. What a strange first of May it was, as I walked the streets of Rome by the early sunlight of the next day. Those were to me grand and impassioned hours. Deep sorrow followed many embarrassments, many pains. Let me once more at parting thank you for the sympathy you showed me amid many of these. A thousand years might pass, and you would find it unforgotten by me. I leave Italy with profound regret, and with only a vague hope of returning. I could have lived here always, full of bright visions, and expanding in my faculties had destiny permitted. May you be happy who remain here." it would be well worth while to be happy in Italy. I had hoped to enjoy some of the last days, but the weather has been steadily bad since you left Florence. Since the fourth of April we had not had a fine day, and all our little plans for visits to favourite spots and beautiful objects from which we have long been separated have been marred. I sail in the bark Elizabeth for New York. She is laden with marble and rags, a very appropriate companionship for wares of Italy. She carries power's statue of Calhoun. Adieu. Remember that we look to you to keep up the dignity of our country. Many important occasions are now likely to offer for the American, I wish I could write the Columbian, man to advocate, more to represent the cause of truth and freedom in the face of their foes. Remember me as their lover and your friend. M. O. To blank. Florence. April 16, 1850. There is a bark at Leghorn highly spoken of which sails at the end of this month, and we shall very likely take that. I find it imperatively necessary to go to the United States to make arrangements that may free me from care. Shall I be more fortunate if I go in person? I do not know. I am ill-adapted to push my claims and pretensions, but at least it will not be such slow work as passing from disappointment to disappointment here, where I wait upon the post-office, and must wait two or three months to know the fate of any proposition. I go home prepared to expect all that is painful and difficult. It will be a consolation to see my dear mother, and my dear brother E., whom I have not seen for ten years, is coming to New England this summer. On that account I wish to go this year. 
May 10th. My head is full of boxes, bundles, phials of medicine, and pots of jelly. I never thought much about a journey for myself, except to try and return all the things, books especially, which I had been borrowing. But about my child I feel anxious lest I should not take what is necessary for his health and comfort on so long a voyage, where omissions are irreparable. The unpropitious rainy weather delays us now from day to day as our ship, the Elizabeth, look out for news of shipwreck, cannot finish taking in her cargo till come one or two good days. I leave Italy with most sad and unsatisfied heart, hoping indeed to return, but fearing that may be not be permitted in my cross-biased life, till strength of feeling and keenness of perception be less than during these bygone rich, if troubled, years. I can say least to those whom I prize most. I am so sad and weary, leaving Italy, that I seem paralyzed. To the same. Ship Elizabeth off Gibraltar, June 8, 1850. My dear M., you will, I trust, long ere receiving this, have read my letter from Florence, enclosing one to my mother, informing her under what circumstances I had drawn on you through blank, and mentioning how I wished the bill to be met in case of any accident to me on my homeward course. That course, as respects weather, has been thus far not unpleasant, but the disaster that has befallen us is such as I never dreamed of. I had taken passage with Captain Hasty, one who seemed to be one of the best and most high-minded of our American men. He showed the kindest interest in us. His wife, an excellent woman, was with him. I thought, during the voyage of safe and my child well, to have as much respite from care and pain as seasickness would permit. But scarcely was that enemy in some measure quelled when the captain fell sick. At first his disease presented the appearance of nervous fever. I was with him a great deal. Indeed, whenever I could relieve his wife from a ministry softened by great love and the courage of womanly heroism. The last days were truly terrible with disgusts and fatigues. For he died, we suppose—no physician has been allowed to come on board to see the body—of confluent smallpox. I have seen, since we parted, great suffering, but nothing physical to be compared to this, where the once fair and expressive mould of man is thus lost in corruption before life is fled. He died yesterday morning, and was buried in deep water, the American consul's barge towing out one from this ship which bore the body, about six o'clock. It was Sunday. A divinely calm, glowing afternoon had succeeded a morning of bleak, cold wind. You cannot think how beautiful the whole thing was. The decent array, and sad reverence of the sailors, the many ships with their banners flying, the stern pillar of Hercules all bathed in roseate vapour the little white sails diving into the blue depths with that solemn spoil of the good man, so still, when he had been so agonized and gasping as the last sun stooped. Yes, it was beautiful, but how dear a price we pay for the poems of this world! We shall now be in quarantine a week, no person permitted to come on board until it be seen whether disease break out in other cases. I have no good reason to think it will not, yet I do not feel afraid. Asali has had it, so he is safe. The baby is, of course, subject to injury. In the earlier days, before I suspected smallpox, I carried him twice into the sick-room at the request of the captain, who was becoming fond of him. He laughed and pointed, he did not discern danger, but only thought it odd to see the old friend there in bed. It is vain by prudence to seek to evade the stern assaults of destiny. I submit. Should all end well, we shall be in New York later than I expected. But keep a lookout. Should we arrive safely, I should like to see a friendly face. Commend me to my dear friends, and with most affectionate wishes that joy and peace may continue to dwell in your house. Adieu. And love as you can. Your friend, Margaret. End of section 34《セクション35 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Kinnear.《Woman in the Nineteenth Century》and kindred papers relating to the sphere, condition, and duties of women by Margaret Fuller. Section 35. Letter from the Honorable Lewis Cass, Jr., 
United States Charge d'Affaires at Rome to Mrs. E. K. Channing. Legation des Etats-Unis d'Amérique, Rome. May 10, 1851. Madame, I beg leave to acknowledge the receipt of your letter and to express my regret that the weak state of my eyesight has prevented me from giving it an earlier reply. In compliance with your request, I have the honor to state succinctly the circumstances connected with my acquaintance with the late Madame Osoli, your deceased sister, during her residence in Rome. In the month of April, 1849, Rome, as you are no doubt aware, was placed in a state of siege by the approach of the French army. It was filled at that time with exiles and fugitives who had been contending for years from Milan in the north to Palermo in the south for the Republican cause, and when the gates were closed, it was computed that there were, of Italians alone, 13,000 refugees within the walls of the city, all of whom had been expelled from adjacent states, till Rome became their last rallying point, and, to many, their final resting place. Among these was to be seen every variety of age, sentiment, and condition, striplings and blanched heads, wild, visionary enthusiasts, grave, heroic men who, in the struggle for freedom, had ventured all and lost all, nobles and beggars, bandits, felons, and brigands. Great excitement naturally existed, and, in the general apprehension which pervaded all classes, that acts of personal violence and outrage would soon be committed, the foreign residents especially found themselves placed in an alarming situation. On the 30th of April, the first engagement took place between the French and Roman troops, and in a few days subsequently I visited several of my countrymen at their request to concert measures for their safety. Hearing on that occasion, and for the first time, of Mrs. Fuller's presence in Rome, and of her solitary mode of life, I ventured to call upon her and offer my services in any manner that might conduce to her comfort and security. She received me with much kindness, and thus an acquaintance commenced. Her residence on the Piazzi Barberini being considered an insecure abode, she removed to the Casa Dias, which was occupied by several American families. In the engagements which succeeded between the Roman and French troops, the wounded of the former were brought into the city and disposed throughout the different hospitals, which were under the superintendence of several ladies of high rank, who had formed themselves into associations, the better to ensure care and attention to those unfortunate men. Miss Fuller took an active part in this noble work, and the greater portion of her time during the entire siege was passed in the hospitals of the Trinity of the Pilgrims, which was placed under her direction in attendance upon its inmates. The weather was intensely hot. Her health was feeble and delicate. The dead and dying were around her in every stage of pain and horror, but she never shrank from the duty she had assumed. Her heart and soul were in the cause for which those men had fought, and all was done that women could do to comfort them in their sufferings. I have seen the eyes of the dying, as she moved among them, extended on opposite beds, meet in commendation of her universal kindness, and the friends of those who had then passed away may derive consolation from the assurance that nothing of tenderness and affection was wanting to soothe their last moments. And I have heard many of those who recovered speak with all the passionate fervor of the Italian nature of her sympathy and compassion throughout their long illness, fulfilled all the offices of love and affection. Mazzini, the chief of the triumvirate, who, better than any man in Rome knew her worth, often expressed to me his admiration of her high character, and the princess Belgioioso, to whom was assigned the charge of the papal palace on the Quirinal, which was converted on this occasion into a hospital, was enthusiastic in her praise. And in a letter which I received not long since from this lady, who was gaining the bread of an exile by teaching languages in Constantinople, she alludes with much feeling to the support afforded by Miss Fuller to the Republican Party in Italy. Here, in Rome, she is still spoken of in terms of regard and endearment, and the announcement of her death was received with a degree of sorrow not often bestowed upon a foreigner, especially one of a different faith. On the 29th of June, the bombardment from the French camp was very heavy, shells and grenades falling in every part of the city. In the afternoon of the 30th, I received a brief note from Miss Fuller requesting me to call at her residence. I did so without delay, and found her lying on a sofa, pale and trembling, evidently much exhausted. She informed me that she had sent for me to place in my hand a packet of important papers, which she wished me to keep for the present, and, in the event of her death, 
to transmit it to her friends in the United States. She then stated that she was married to the Marquis of Soli, who was in command of a battery on the Pincian Hill, that being the highest and most exposed position in Rome, and directly in the line of bombs from the French camp. It was not to be expected, she said, that he could escape the dangers of another night, such as the last, and, therefore, it was her intention to remain with him and share his fate. At the Ave Maria, she added, he would come for her, and they would proceed together to his post. The packet which she placed in my possession contained, she said, the certificates of her marriage and of the birth and baptism of her child. After a few words more, I took my departure, the hour she named having nearly arrived. At the porter's lodge, I met the Marquis Osoli, and a few minutes afterwards I saw them walking toward the Pincian Hill. Happily, the cannonading was not renewed that night, and at dawn of day she returned to her apartments with her husband by her side. On that day the French army entered Rome, and the gates being opened, Madame Osoli, accompanied by the Marquis, immediately proceeded to Rieti, where she had left her child in charge of a confidential nurse, formerly in the service of the Osoli family. She remained, as you are no doubt aware, some months at Rieti, whence she removed to Florence, where she resided until her ill-fated departure for the United States. During this period I received several letters from her, all of which, though reluctant to part with them, I enclose to your address in compliance with your request. I am, Madame, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Louis Cass, Jr. End of Section 35 Recording by Nicholas Kinnear, Dayton, Ohio End of Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller